I worked at a local government agency for a long time. Each summer, we would get a new crop of interns. Most were fine. Some caused issues, like when we caught two of them making out in the file room, but overall, they were just normal kids from high school or college trying to get some work experience. In 2016, my department received an intern later than usual, right in the middle of summer. Warner was a bit older than the usual crowd, around my age, maybe late 20s. We initially hit it off pretty well, and although I found him sort of strange, I didn't mind since he was friendly and we had some common interests. He was the only person in my department who was even close to my age. The interns were all teenagers, and the regular staff averaged around 60 years old, which is older than my mom. I was psyched to have a peer to chat with, so occasionally I would eat lunch with Warner, or stop by his cubicle, and have a chat. His strangeness was mostly an outsized personality, a mix of over-the-top enthusiasm with a bit of social awkwardness, but I got zero bad vibes from the guy. It wasn't long before Warner started having major performance problems at work. He would produce little to no work on most days, no show or arrive late without informing anyone, and generally acted unprofessionally. One day, he showed up for work at 3.15 p.m., when our workday ended at 4.30. The office manager was livid and told him to go home. His behavior bothered nearly everyone in my office, but I didn't supervise him, and we had plenty of slacker interns in the past. While his antics were a bit of a spectacle, it wasn't a big deal to me. If you're wondering why he wasn't let go, two words, political favor. I found out from Warner himself that he was hired because his uncle had donated to the campaign of our big boss, so he wasn't going anywhere. Near the end of that summer, I put in my notice that I was leaving my job and relocating to a new state. Once Warner caught wind of this, he would constantly complain that it sucked I was leaving because we barely had time to become friends. I would always laugh lightly in response and give a sympathetic, yeah. He would start to monopolize my time at work more and more, and it became disruptive to the people who sat near me. I found it slightly annoying, but I also was extremely happy to be leaving that job for reasons unrelated to Warner, and I spent my last month there not caring much about what my coworkers thought. I tolerated Warner lingering by my desk. One day, he caught me leaving work and offered me a ride home. I usually took the bus, and occasionally other coworkers would offer me rides home if they were going my way, so this didn't seem odd to me. I accepted and walked to his car with him. It smelled awful and was full of garbage. He hastily cleared off the passenger seat and apologized for the mess. We got on our way, but once we were on the main road, he started begging me to stop and get dinner with him. I laughed and said he didn't need to ask me that intensely, and said we could stop at a diner on the way. We had a nice meal, with pleasant conversation even. He was intelligent and had a variety of interests, our political positions aligned, and we shared disdain for our cranky old co-workers. I had a good time. I expressed that he didn't need to drive me all the way home now that it was late, but he kept insisting. So, I relented. As I directed him towards my house, he started in again with the whining about how our developing friendship was cut short because I was moving. At this point, I was tired of hearing this. The decision to leave my job and move away from home was extremely difficult to make, and I was proud of how bold I was being. I stopped responding and laughing, and his whining began to fade out. We came up to the turn to get onto my street, and as I pointed it out, he accelerated and drove right past it laughing. I chuckled, almost in a, oh my god, what the f kind of way, thinking that he was just joking around. When I began giving instructions about how to turn around and get back, he started begging me to keep the hangout session going, because he was lonely. This immediately set me on high alert. It suddenly hit me that I'm in a man's car, someone I don't know that well, who doesn't exercise proper behavior at work, which is the only context that I know him from. And now, he's displaying weird behavior outside of work as well. My instinct was to not insist I be let out of his car. I felt as if this would escalate the situation into something bad. And in hindsight, 
It may have been the right thing to do when I think about the type of person that he turned out to be. I told him we could hang out at the park near my house if he wanted to talk. He seemed to like that idea, and we parked and walked over. The pleasant conversations resumed. Besides the weird clinginess, he was perfectly fine to talk to, until he dumped his entire life story on me, including his prior arrest for theft, his heroin addiction, and related struggles with depression. I tried to be sympathetic, but I was very put off by this. It was a lot of highly personal information all at once, and I was still on alert because of his prior behavior. I tried changing the subject by showing him pics of my dog. I scrolled one pic too far on the roll, and the next photo was of me wearing makeup and posing cutely, way different than the slob that I was at work. He grabbed the phone and went, Wow, you are very photogenic. I felt awkward and didn't say anything in response. There was a long silence. Then he launched into a weird tangent about how compatible we were and that we have similar interests, etc., etc. Ultimately, it got to the point where he said that he wished that I wasn't moving so we could try hanging out again, but this time, on a date. I didn't say anything, and he broke the silence with, Sorry I'm saying all this stuff. I'm actually high right now. That's why I know where Riverside, the bad neighborhood that had previously come up in conversation, is. I went there yesterday to score. Otherwise, I wouldn't have said it, so I'm really sorry. Internally, I freaked out. He had definitely put his drug addiction in the past tense, and I assumed it was something he was recovering from, not currently in the midst of. I also realized I had been in a car that he was operating while he was under the influence. I don't know anything about heroin, so I was clueless. And overall, I just felt very stupid. He immediately started whining and begging me not to judge him or hate him, and kept saying over and over again how nice I am and how understanding I am, that I'm pretty and smart. All of these weird compliments interspersed with talking down about himself. I didn't know what to do, so I smiled reassuringly and told him not to worry, but that I was tired and wanted to go home. That's when he started crying. He had this weird, wheezy sob, but no tears were coming out. I sat there silently while he did this, trying to come up with some sort of graceful escape plan. My patience was wearing thin, and my anxiety was now through the roof. It's a weird feeling to be both annoyed and panicky at the same time. I stood up and apologized, said the park was close to my house, so... I'll just hoof it home, and started to leave when I remembered I left my stuff in his car. Trying a new approach, I casually mentioned that I forgot my stuff in his car, and joked that if he wanted my dirty lunch containers, he could keep them. He ceased his bizarre crying, stood up and ran over to his car to unlock it, and I grabbed my stuff out of his back seat. His demeanor changed drastically as he calmly apologized for making things weird, and asked if he could drop me off at home so I didn't have to walk alone at night. I said yes, but made him drop me off a block over from my little side street, so he wouldn't see which house was mine. I could end it there, but what bothered me the most about this guy happened after this encounter. I'll try to make this part short. A week or two after that weird evening, end of August by this point, I had my last day at the job and moved a thousand miles across the country. Warner would sometimes text me long ramblings detailing his feelings about himself and about our missed opportunity. I didn't respond to these messages. Now that I wasn't near him, I didn't feel the need to placate. The text stopped after a few weeks, and I all but forgot about him. Fast forward to February, and I get a text from a former co-worker. Her message said, Sorry you had to hear about it like this. And her next message was a link to a local news article titled, Man Dies from Wounds in Riverside stabbing on Wednesday. Because of the way she worded it, I thought Warner was the victim. But when I read the article, it included his mugshot and the charges against him. He was the attacker. He had murdered someone. I felt so shocked and disgusted. I couldn't believe that I knew someone who took another human's life. Later on, I called an old work friend for some of the details. Apparently, Shortly after I left the job, Warner was fired for trashing the men's bathroom. Like, 
He just threw around anything he could lift, pouring out all the soap from the dispensers, turning over trash cans, and scattering debris all over the place. He then lost his apartment. Presumably, some of the articles about the stabbing describe Warner as homeless. I have to assume that that's how he ended up in the aforementioned Riverside. There are a lot of homeless drug addicts who squat in abandoned houses there. I wondered if the man that he stabbed had refused to give him something that he wanted, and that is how he reacted to a hard no. I don't think I made all of the wisest decisions during my interactions with Warner, but I'm glad I was able to avoid setting him off, since he was clearly not stable. Hands down, Warner had to be the worst intern that I'd ever encountered. I live in a small, small town. Like, you blink and you'll miss it. The best we can boast is that we have a single stop sign and a gas station which we only have because of the nearby highway. Any actual semblance of a town is almost half an hour away. So when things get scary out here, it's amplified. The occasional homeless person is no big deal. They're often drifting through. Drug addicts run rampant and will steal everything they can from your house. But it's the normal out here. However, what happened a few years back certainly wasn't normal. Originally, I was dead asleep in my bed. I only woke up because it was burning hot in my room. It was summertime, and there wasn't much I could do about that. I just remember tossing and turning until I got a creepy feeling that fell into the pit of my stomach. I glanced over to the bathroom door that was open with the light on. Everything was normal. I left the light on so I wouldn't trip and die if I had to pee in the middle of the night. But next, I glanced at the window directly across from my bed. I had no curtains, but I did have a shitty set of blinds. Part of the blinds had been broken from wear and tear, and the crappy AC output beneath it would make them move back and forth so you'd get a glimpse outside every so often. The yard light was still going, but what made me stop was the outline outside of my window. The figure of someone directly beyond my window pane, almost like it was waiting for the blinds to move to watch me. I didn't have an imagination as a child. That had been trained out of me. But the sight was enough to pour every horror film into my head at that very moment. I squeezed my eyes shut and pulled my blankets over my head and slept in a cloth oven that night. By morning time, the figure was gone. I remember running to my mom's room on the verge of tears in the morning, telling her what had happened. She laughed at me like I was an idiot told me that it was probably just a stray cat that had climbed up there for one odd reason or another. I almost believed her, since my window was pretty high off the ground, but something just didn't sit right with me. Later that day when we were doing yard work, I glanced over at my window and saw one of our metal patio chairs had been pushed up to it. I pointed it out to my mom, who proceeded to chew me out. That's how the cat probably got up there, moron. Stop leaving furniture everywhere but I hadn't moved it. It was heavy enough that I struggled with it. So we moved it back, and so began a pattern. At night, I'd see the figure, complain to my mom, and we'd find a chair moved back every single morning. And this went on for a few weeks. My mother stopped caring about my concerns until one morning we saw where the outside screen of my window had been sliced open. I still remember her shaking her head and complaining about those damn stray cats, the ones that we had still yet to see. I could tell she was unnerved by the development. I couldn't handle it anymore, and I opted to sleep in our living room that night. The only problem was, our kitchen and living room connected, which meant there were always several windows. The first night of my move went well, despite my back hurting from the couch. I avoided my room like the plague. It wasn't until about four days later that we ran into an issue. I woke up and glanced at the clock above the fireplace. It read a little past 3 a.m. I couldn't realize why I'd woken up until it happened again. There was a beam of light shining in from the kitchen window, almost as if someone was shining a flashlight through. I saw it trace along the walls and land on the love seat across from the couch that I was on. I was absolutely mortified. When I told my mom, she continued to laugh at me. I gave in 
and decided that I would sleep in my dad's room, even though it had a gigantic window in it. He slept in the recliner with a huge TV, so I felt more safe having someone around. The yard light was directly outside the window anyway, so it seemed foolproof. That was until I woke up out of habitual fear and watched through the window across from the bed. Everything seemed normal as time drug on, and I felt like a moron. Maybe my mom was right. That was until I saw a lone figure come out of the woods by the backyard shed, walk directly under the light, and head to the patio furniture like he'd been here plenty of times before. I still remember the large build the man had, and the confidence like he was the one who lived here and wasn't creeping around my yard in the dead of night. I just remember listening to the TV until I fell asleep again, hoping to get another glimpse. My dad would have been pissed if I had woken him up. He was grumpy on a good day, terrifying on a bad. I didn't feel like risking it unless I had solid proof because of just how scared I was. The next morning, my mom chewed me out again for the patio furniture, which was pretty much routine by this point. Although this time, something new happened. She demanded I stop playing in the toolboxes of the garage. A bunch of tools had been taken out and left on our doorstep. Screwdrivers, a large hammer, flashlight. But it wasn't me. I begged with my mom, pleaded with her, just stay up with me one night. We couldn't close our garage because it was an open carport, and I wasn't going to get my ass beaten for touching tools because of someone else. It was driving me mad. Finally, she agreed. That night, we would stay awake in the living room. I finally fell asleep before my mom, but I remember her waking me up in a panic. She pointed to the window that overlooked into our garage. We could see the top of someone's head as they walked back and forth. There was the sound of someone placing metal tools down on brick steps, as if they were trying to be quiet, but couldn't fully muffle it. She whispered for me to go wake my dad. My dad was angry, having been woken up in the middle of the night by his frantic daughter. He grabbed his pistol and headed out the back door, towards the front of the house where the garage was located. We heard my dad screaming and someone dropping tools. Then, the sound of a gunshot twice. Crazed footsteps pounding around the garage, and they felt as if they were coming directly from my chest. My mom peeked out the window, and then opened the door, just as my dad stumbled in. He had missed both shots because of his unstable aim, but told us that there was a man crouching at our front door, looking at our door handle. None of us slept that night, and in the morning, we phoned the police from the nearest town. They didn't do much besides ask if anything had been stolen, asked for a description of the man, and then told us to install cameras. But that was it. They said that whoever the guy was probably was just looking for something easy to steal for quick money. If that had been the case, why hadn't he stolen the tools, the generator, the welder, or broken into any of the vehicles just sitting in our garage? We finally set up hunting trail cameras around the house, but... Nothing has happened since. Coming home from college for holidays, I still have nightmares about this, even years later when I sleep in my own bed. I don't know what he was looking for or why he did the things that he was doing. But whatever the case may be, man at the window, let's not meet. This story dates back to my childhood. I was 12 and my older sister and I were home alone for the weekend. I was waiting for a friend to pick me up and getting restless. There was a knock at the door and thinking it was her, I ran to answer it without checking through the peephole. There was a man standing there with a clipboard and he said that he needed to check our gas meter. I was entrenched in the disappointment of my friend still not having arrived so I just told him, yeah, sure, whatever you need to do. I didn't notice at the time, but he wasn't dressed as a city official. He had on a green and purple t-shirt with bold stripes, like the host of Blue's Clues. He took a step inside the door and immediately went up the stairs to where our bedrooms were and walked into the open door of my room, the typical girly-girly room with pink and glitter. Thank God my sister 
came down the stairs at almost that exact same moment. She said, Oh, is that Daphne's dad? Why is he going upstairs? That's when I took the moment to complain about how Daphne wasn't here yet and was going on about how unreliable she was when my sister cut me off. Wait, wait. If Daphne isn't here, then who is that? I said, He's here to read the gas meters. Her face turned white. She flung open the front door and dragged me out, hand clamped over my protesting mouth. She said, Our gas meters are outside. Neither of us had a cell phone. Nobody did. It was the 60s. And obviously, we weren't going back in the house to call the authorities on the landline. Then, my ever-resourceful sister had a stroke of genius. At that very moment, there was a man walking right by our house, and she motioned him over. She spoke to the man, clearly and loudly enough that her voice carried directly into our house. Oh, Dad, it's good you're home. There's a man from the city here to read the gas meters upstairs. And just like she had hoped, the man on the street said, What are you talking about? The man that had entered our house, the one in the striped shirt, bolted from within, running down the block before hitting a corner and vanishing from view. The man we were speaking to asked us repeatedly if we were okay, if we needed him to stay and wait in the yard with us until our parents came home. He was a very kind man. We were so startled that we barely thanked him before he ran back in the house, slamming and locking the doors and windows shut. As irate as my sister was that I let someone in the house, she begged me to not call the police because my parents left her in charge and she worried that she'd be in trouble. I didn't want to catch any heat from carelessly allowing some guy in, so I was on the same page with her. But three weeks later, a girl in our community went missing. Same MO. She was home alone, and authorities found the door open with no signs of forced entry. My sister and I discussed our options, but deep down, we knew we had no choice but to come clean. We told the police everything. I don't know if it ever helped, but they did tell us that they had reason to believe that it was likely the same man. They also tracked down the man who had helped us on the street. Turns out, we already knew him. He worked in the butcher shop, but in our panic, we didn't recognize him. He was lifelong friends with our family after that. Our parents were mortified. They weren't angry with us, just glad we were okay. Though they did have to review all the rules of caution and didn't leave us home alone for quite a while. They ultimately found the missing neighborhood girl. Unfortunately, not alive. According to the police, it was likely that she had been held for a few days before being burned alive. They never did catch the guy in the striped shirt. From what I remember, he was probably in his 30s back in the early 1960s, so my guess is that he's long gone by now, whether from natural causes or karma for the life that he was living. Both my sister and I felt a tremendous amount of guilt for being so focused on not getting in trouble that we kept our mouths shut when it potentially would have helped that girl if we were more forthcoming in the moment. That is something that I still deal with to this day. I thank the Lord for my sister's resourcefulness and quick action that day though. I do not doubt that it made all the difference in the world between us surviving and facing the same fate as that other neighborhood girl. This story happened back in the summer of 2021. I lived by myself in a nice house inside a small town. Low crime, but still the occasional shady f***er comes around. Anyway, I was at work that day, on a smoke break. I happened to watch a dog get thrown from a moving vehicle. Four lane city traffic during the start of rush hour. I ran right out there, scooped his little ass up, and booked it back to my workplace. He wasn't injured, amazingly, and as a bleeding heart animal lover, I decided to take him home with me until I could figure out what exactly to do with him. I have a large amount of cats, and always have, but this was my first experience with a dog that I was solely responsible for. This guy was very shy, 
head hung, tail tucked, jumpy, just looking at me with these big sad eyes like I was about to beat him. I was clueless on the subject of dog personalities and tendencies. I just knew they needed to be taken out frequently. His first night with me, we had been out maybe 15 times, as I didn't want him shitting in my house. I was having my final cigarette of the night on my porch at around 11 p.m. The dog was on a lead, chilling under my chair as I smoked and poked about on Reddit. I see a man walking on the sidewalk that runs right by my house. The man kept glancing up at me before he passed. Shortly after he passed my house, he stopped, turned on a heel, and approached. Hey, can you tell me where 302 Church Street is? He asked. I told him that I would search the address on my phone, which of course was taking a minute to load. He explained that he didn't have a phone of his own and was attempting to get to a friend's house, taking small steps towards me the whole time. Finally, the address that I summoned came up. It's exactly two blocks north of here, right on the southwest corner of the cross street, I told him, pointing in the direction. He kept his eyes locked on me, continuing to slowly move closer. Doggo starts growling very softly at this point. I'd forgotten he was even there up until now. Mind if I take a look at the map? He grinned sheepishly. I'm bad with directions. I rose from my seat, pointing once more. It's just two blocks up this road. Just follow it. Two blocks. The house will be on your left, making it very clear that I wasn't just going to give him my phone. Well, can I call them? I need to let them know that I'm coming, he said, still creeping closer, extending his hand this time. No, I curtly replied. How about text them, pushing forward still? Dude, no, I started towards my door. Just, just let me see your phone. He was visibly becoming pissed off, clearly trying to contain it and getting way too close to my porch. As a last ditch effort of getting this dude to f off, I say, dude, you need to get the f out of my yard. My dog is protective and he will f you up. Hell, I didn't know the first f***ing thing about this dog, let alone whether he had the capacity to f someone up. I just hoped that saying so would intimidate pushy phone guy. Like I had said the magic words, Pupper springs into action, a la the wolf creature from the never-ending story. He emerges like a bullet from under the chair, growling, snarling, barking his little tail off. He jerks me damn near off the porch trying to get at this guy. He sounded and acted like a 100-pound attack dog, not a 35-pound timid beagle mix. I was afraid. I didn't know if the pup would turn on me. As stated previously, at the time I knew absolutely jack shit about dogs. He backed his hindquarters into my legs, almost nudging me to the door, still carrying on. Eyes locked on the phone dude and baring his teeth every step of the way. Phone dude holds up his hands and backs off, stammers something like, uh, two blocks north, yeah, got it, and begins walking that way. I head inside, cut off my lights and peek out the window at him. The guy glances back at my house, assured that I'm inside. He turns and begins walking the completely opposite direction of which I had originally pointed him in. The icing on the cake? He pulls out a phone from his pocket and raises it to his ear as if to make a call. Doggo secured his place as a member of my family that night. He is incredibly protective of me and has frightened away more than one other creep since this incident. He's attached to my hip and has made it known that he is grateful to be in a safe and loving home, wherein he will never again become a projectile from a moving vehicle. His name is Hank, and I truly believe that that night would have ended very poorly for me had he not been there. To preface this story, I have to say that I truly enjoy driving, like hours-long drives to nowhere with no destination in mind, just me, my music, and the road ahead of me. Living in Nebraska, I'd often take back roads or lonely highways cutting through the countryside to small towns, and eventually cities, and I'd usually take these drives at night, since there was way less traffic to worry about. This is something that I've done ever since I got my license four, maybe five years ago. 
and I've never once had any sort of issue, nor have I ever run into any trouble. That was until a few nights ago. For reference, I'm a relatively small 22-year-old female, and as I've stated before, I often take these drives completely and utterly alone. They're a good way to clear my head when I'm stressed, upset, or overwhelmed, or for me to get a plan together to sort personal issues out. I've also done these long and lonely drives to get away from the toxicity of my household when I used to live with my parents as a means of coping with their alcoholism. Though, now that I've moved out and am in a much better place mentally, I don't really have the urge to get in my car and just drive anymore. Not much, at least. However, on the night that this event took place, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed, stressed, and anxious with a clusterfuck of personal issues that I'd rather not get into. I felt restless and irritable around my boyfriend, couldn't focus on anything else, and decided I would take a drive to clear my head. My boyfriend was understanding and told me to be careful and not to be gone for too terribly long, since it was already getting pretty late. I agreed, gave him a kiss goodbye, and left. I drove around our city for about 30 minutes, but I was still feeling on edge about everything transpiring in my personal life, so I decided to drive further north down those familiar, dark, winding one-lane highways. I kept the car at a steady 65 miles per hour, taking the turns at a slower pace in case a deer jumped out around the bend and was admiring the vast empty darkness of the snow-capped fields and barren trees. It was honestly a bit creepy being all alone with no cars in sight, in seemingly the middle of nowhere, the few houses miles back from the road lightless, and the dead cornfields withered away and covered in snow. It was like something out of a horror movie, and I half expected to see a ghost pop up in my rearview mirror, or to see someone clamber out from the patches of trees dotting the horizon. The only light came from my headlights, and even then, I still strained to see through the inky darkness of the night. By now, it was just after midnight, and I told myself that once I had made the familiar roundabout that would either take you to a small town or back up towards the city, I would head back home. The roundabout was still maybe 15 to 20 minutes away, but other than my imagination picturing the worst, I wasn't really all that concerned. I mean, I was by myself. I didn't have any other motorist to worry about. Right? Wrong. As I'm rounding another bend, I notice a vehicle with its hazard lights flashing, maybe a quarter of a mile in front of me. It was some sort of sedan, dark colored, and was angled to where only part of it was on the shoulder while the rest jutted out onto the road, like they had tried to pull over in a hurry but didn't quite manage to do that. The driver's side door was flung wide open, and as I slowed my vehicle down and angled it towards the opposite side of the road to pass, I could make out what looked like maybe blood on the inside of the open door. I didn't see anyone on the road or in the car, and I was the only motorist in sight. Cell phone reception is pretty spotty at best in this part of the country. But more often than not, you couldn't get reception no matter how hard you prayed, which was definitely the case when I took a glance at my phone to see if I had any bars. So, a lone female on the road, at night, pulling up nearby to a vacant vehicle that looks like someone had been attacked on the inside, with no cell service. Just great. Now, I'm no dummy. I've watched countless episodes of Investigation Discovery and Criminal Minds, and read far too many true crime books to know that this had bad and danger written all over it. But there was still a small part of me that worried something terrible had happened to whoever was in that vehicle, and I thought I needed to help. These roads don't get a lot of traffic late at night, and the temperatures were well below freezing by now. If someone were hurt or in trouble, there was no one and nothing else to help them but me. Still, I erred on the side of caution, I was still driving my car, though a bit more slowly, and as I approached the vehicle, I rolled down my passenger side window a bit, shut off the music, and called out, Hey, anyone there? Are you okay? I didn't hear a response. I worried they were passed out somewhere, but I wasn't about to get out and go look for them. I told myself that I'd call out one more time, and if I didn't hear anything, I would leave, and the moment that there was reception, I'd call it in, and if I did hear someone, well, 
I'd figure out my next course of action then. So again, I shout, Hey, what happened? Are you okay? There was silence for a beat, and then I heard rustling in the shadows of the trees, followed by a gruff voice saying, Yeah? I was relieved at first, and was about to say something in response, or possibly even stop my car and get out, when I noticed three things nearly simultaneously. As I inched my way past the front of the sedan, I noticed that there was no damage to the hood or anywhere else on the vehicle, which I found to be strange considering the blood on the inside of the door. In my rearview mirror, I caught a glance of someone creeping out from behind the sedan and they were making their way towards my car, fast. The person didn't have any blood on them, nor did they appear to be injured in any way. They were wearing a mask, but not like a face mask for COVID or a ski mask or anything normal like that, but one of those masks you would see in the Purge movies, and they were holding something in their hand. I don't know for sure what it was, I couldn't get a good look, but from its length and shape, my guess was maybe a tire iron or a crowbar. I don't need to tell you that I slammed on the gas the moment I noticed those things and drove like a bat straight out of hell, my heart thundering in my chest, my entire body shaking. My window was still rolled down in my haste and the music was still shut off, so I could very clearly hear someone, definitely a man, shouting at me, though I had no clue what they were saying. I just knew that I had to get out of there, immediately. I stole one last look in my rearview mirror as I drove off, mostly to see if they were getting in their sedan to chase or if they had stopped. The man with the weapon was still standing in the middle of the road watching me, and right before I looked away from the mirror, I saw a second man emerge from the trees that had been rustling earlier, also wearing one of those creepy masks with no trace of blood on him. I probably broke every law for speeding that night, but I wanted to get as far away from those men as possible. As soon as I made it to the roundabout, I turned towards the small town, parked in the Walmart parking lot that thankfully still had cars from who I assumed were workers closing up shop, and proceeded to have a full-on meltdown. When I could pull myself together, I called one of my friends, T, who was a police officer, to tell him what had happened and ask what I should do. He was concerned for me, and after asking if I was okay, where I was, did they follow me? He told me that since this was out of the city limits, he couldn't do much on his end, but he could get in contact with the local police or sheriff in that jurisdiction to take my statement and to check it out. I agreed, thanked him, and while I waited for the police to show up, I called my boyfriend. Through my hysterical sobs and panic, I managed to tell him what happened not even 10 or so minutes ago. He was, as you could imagine, super freaked for my safety and wanted me to either come home immediately or drive down himself to take me home. I told him the police were on their way to take my statement so I couldn't leave, but that I was okay, and I stayed on the phone with him until I saw the familiar police cruisers pulling into the lot. I gave the police my statement, and they assured me they would go back to the spot I told them the sedan had been to take a look and that they would try to catch the guys who had done it. Though, with no cameras and no description of the men, I wasn't sure they'd be able to. I didn't even get the license plate number. Though, at the time of my panic, the thought never came to mind until the police were asking if I got it. All they had to go off of was a dark colored sedan and two guys in masks. After I gave my statement, I went home and stayed curled up close to my boyfriend the entire night listening to every sound the house made in fear it would be those guys arriving any minute to finish whatever it was they started. Since the incident, I haven't heard back from the police about whether or not they have any leads, and I'm not sure if I ever will. I'm just thankful I'm still here and that I didn't stop my car or get out. I'm not sure what would have become of me if I had. I still have so many questions that have zero answers. What were they doing? Why? Was that blood on the inside of the car, or just a ruse to get more attention? If it really was blood, did they hurt someone else? And what would have happened to me if I had stopped my car? Needless to say, I won't be going on any more late night drives to anywhere, and I hope 
I never cross paths with those freaks ever again. This happened to me yesterday, and before anyone says a thing, yes, I know I'm stupid. I had just gotten home from work around 9 p.m. and had barely had any time to get my shoes off when I get a phone call from some number that I don't recognize. Now, I'm searching for new jobs and thought that it might be one of the places that I was applying to calling me back. I answer the call, and it's some guy who says that he's with some kind of third-party detention center which, as he explained it, was for low-risk inmates that were sent there whenever the local jails were busy or filled. That should have set off a nice big red flag for me, but for whatever reason, it just made sense in my tired brain. I'm getting ready to tell this guy that I'm not interested in making a donation or anything like that, when he asks, am I speaking with, and then says my full name. I confirm and he says that they're holding my boyfriend at the center, saying my boyfriend's full name and giving me a dead-on description of him. I ask what was going on since my boyfriend was supposed to be at work right now, and the guy on the other end provides an explanation. He says that my boyfriend had struck a pregnant woman with his car on his way to work that day, and that he happened to have a blood alcohol content four times the legal limit. He said that the woman was in critical condition and that my boyfriend had broken a few ribs and his nose in the accident. I'm freaking out at this point and ask if I can speak to my boyfriend, to which the man obliges. I'm put on hold for a moment or two before my boyfriend picks up the line. This person on the other end was panicking, saying how it wasn't his fault, and he begged me to not tell his parents, again using my name in his pleas. It didn't particularly sound like my boyfriend, but... I figured it was because of the broken nose that he supposedly had, and his tone really helped to sell it, because it all sounded so legitimate. The original man came back on the line before I had a chance to ask any questions, and explains that they had to sedate my boyfriend since he had begun to panic and hyperventilate, which I was starting to relate to more and more by the second. The man on the other end of the phone tells me that I should come right away and that the bail is set for $2,000 cash only. I stupidly tell him that I don't have that much, and that I might have half of that. He tells me that it's fine, and that I can work something out with the front office, once I get there, and to just bring what I have, seeming as if he's trying to calm me down. He's giving me the address, and I can barely hold a pen because my hands are shaking so badly, and I'm very poorly trying to hold back tears, when all of a sudden, the front door flings open, and in walks my boyfriend. Completely normal looking, no broken nose, but more than a little confused as to why I'm crying. I'm still on the phone with this man, and ask him what the f he thinks he's doing, telling him how my boyfriend just walked in, just as this man promptly hangs up. I tried calling the number back a few times, but was hit with the quintessential. The user you have reached has traveled outside of the service area. Please try your call again. I found out that the power to the bar that my boyfriend worked at had gone out, so his boss sent everyone home early, and I can honestly say that I've never been so grateful for a power outage ever in my life. My boyfriend slept on the couch to keep watch, but unfortunately, I still couldn't sleep that night, so I decided to look up the name of the organization that the man said that he worked for. Big surprise, it turned up nothing. I then looked up the address that he had given me on Google Maps, just to see that it was some random abandoned strip mall in the middle of a sketchy-ass area nearly an hour and a half outside of town. What really freaked me out about this whole thing was the guy knew my number, both me and my boyfriend's full names, but didn't sound like anyone we had ever met before. I have no idea what would have been waiting for me there, but I'm counting my lucky stars right now. So, to the guy who wanted to meet me for only God knows what, at that sketchy-ass strip mall, let's not meet. Hey guys, we'll get back to the story shortly, but I wanted to share this truly terrifying stat with you all. Did you know that about 80% of you watching this video are yet to hit the subscribe button? Spooky, I know. But if you enjoy the content that we create here, 
I highly encourage you to join the community. It's cozy, comfy, and rather disturbing at times. So for those that enjoy that type of thing and haven't done it yet, please consider hitting that subscribe button now. That single click plus your sustained viewership really helps us creators to find a stronger grip on the platform and can mean a huge difference in the audience that we reach, which directly affects the growth and continued success of our channel over the long term. I appreciate you all for being a part of this journey, and I look forward to bringing you even more high quality and highly unsettling content as we go. For now though, let's get back to the program. This happened in the fall of 1993, when I was 20 years old. In the interest of context, this was before I started college, and I was working in the material prep department of a plastics factory during the night shift. I was the only woman in the department, and my male coworkers were initially skeptical that I could even handle the job, but I proved myself and earned their respect. It was hard work, but on the plus side, it also put me in the best shape of my life. It was also about the same time that I dumped my abusive boyfriend. He was verbally, emotionally, and physically abusive, as well as being an alcoholic. This fact, more than anything, is probably why I got myself into this situation in the first place. I had just gotten off of work. It was nearly 1.30 a.m., and my car was running on fumes, so I stopped at a local gas station to fill up. While I was pumping gas, a woman about my age approached me, looking both nervous and scared. She said that she had been at her boyfriend's house and they had gotten into a fist fight. She'd walked to the gas station to use the payphone and call a friend to pick her up. On her way to the station, a car pulled up as she was walking and the guys inside started catcalling and harassing her. With a slight movement of her head, she indicated a car that was parked off to the side by the gas station dumpsters. I saw a large, light green car maybe a Cadillac or a Lincoln, with at least two, maybe three shadowy figures inside. She said that they had threatened her, and she was too scared to call her friend and wait. The woman was neat, well-dressed, didn't seem high or drunk or anything like that. She just seemed really nervous and freaked out. So I didn't even hesitate. I finished pumping my gas and told her to hop in the car, that I'd take her home. At that time, on a weeknight, there was little traffic, so I booked it right out of the gas station and asked her where she lived. She kept twisting around in the seat to see if the car was behind us, and when I asked her to put her seatbelt on, she ignored me and continued looking for the car. I had assumed that she was just terrified. A few blocks down the road, however, I noticed that she was looking around the car, and she started asking me about money. Where's your purse? Where's your bag? I need money. You need to give me some money. My stomach sank. I have this woman in my car, and now she's going to rob me? But when I thought about it, robbery just didn't make much sense. I was driving a 1985 Chevette, affectionately nicknamed Shitbox, and was wearing my work clothes, a ratty t-shirt and jeans with combat boots. I did not look like a person with a lot of cash, primarily because I wasn't a person with a lot of cash. She twisted around in the seat again and started yelling. There they are. There they are. She didn't sound scared anymore, though. I checked the rear view, and sure enough, that light green car is right behind us. She started cackling and bouncing up and down in the seat. My boys are going to fuck you up, bitch. They're going to fuck you up. She's laughing like crazy, opening the glove box, looking in the back for a bag or purse, telling me all the messed up these guys are planning to do to me. Now, if I had been smart, I would have just driven to the police station. Actually, if I had been very smart, I would have called the cops from the gas station and waited with her until they arrived. That would have been the intelligent thing to do, but unfortunately, none of this crossed my mind until later. In the moment, I just got really, really f***ing angry. I realized three things all at once. One, there was an intersection up ahead with cars on either side waiting to cross, and the light had just turned yellow. Two, I had a spare box cutter that I kept for work in the driver's side door compartment. Three, the crazy bitch still hadn't put on her seatbelt. 
At this point, I didn't think. I floored it, passed under the yellow light just as it turned red. I glanced back to see if the green car was still behind me, but the cross traffic at the intersection had started to move, and the green car hadn't caught up. The bitch started yelling. That's when I slammed on the brakes, and she hit the dash and windshield with a solid and viciously satisfying crack. When she rebounded to the passenger seat, I had the box cutter in her face, and was screaming some serious batch crazy things at her. I can't remember exactly what I said, but it was along the lines of, get the fuck out, get the fuck out of my car before I cut off your face and make you eat it, bitch. The crazy screaming and box cutter combo worked. She grabbed blindly at the handle and popped the door open, and I began shoving and punching her until the bitch tumbled out the door to the curb. I stomped on the gas, got to the next turn, and squealed around it with a passenger door still open. I made a few more turns because I was afraid that the green car might catch up to me. After a little while, I stopped to close the passenger door. Then I cut across town to get on the highway to head home. I was on the highway for nearly five minutes before the shakes started. I pulled off to the shoulder to calm down and try to get my shit together before continuing the drive home. I told my older sister, who I was living with temporarily after the breakup with my ex, everything that had happened. She wrapped me in a tight bear hug while simultaneously yelling about how stupid I was for not going to the police. I can tell you now, I've never been so glad to be yelled at in my life. At the time of this story, I was 11 years old and living in a nice suburban area with my family. We had recently moved into this house that my parents had built and it was our first quote, home versus being a rented house in a sketchy area. And this was a very nice neighborhood by comparison. The whole family made friends quickly with lots of our neighbors, but especially the ones three doors down. They had a daughter my age, I'm a guy by the way, and a daughter five years younger, which happened to be the same age as my younger sister. Our parents got along well, and we began hanging out quite a bit for barbecues at their house or parties at our house. Friendships were formed quickly and seemed to be very strong. After a year or so, I started realizing things weren't quite what they seemed. I remember seeing police cars at their house a few times in the evenings, and when I'd ask my parents what was going on, it was always nothing. Just checking in on them type answers. I was no genius, but at 11, I knew that that didn't add up. Why would the cops check up on them and not check up on us? One day, I'm at the neighbor's house playing and hanging out, when the daughter goes across the street to get another mutual friend of ours, which left me and the father alone in this house. This was not really a big deal as it had happened before, but then he approached me and things seemed just a little off. I still don't know what made me feel this way, but I was uncomfortable and started thinking about leaving. About five minutes later, he tells me that he has something cool to show me. I don't remember what it was, but I think that it was something about baseball cards, which I was very fond of as a child. I excitedly started to follow him when he pulled the attic ladder down and asked me to follow him, which I started to do without hesitation at first. Then something happened and I still can't quite process what it was. He was ahead of me on the ladder and when he looked back to help me into the attic, there was something that raised alarm bells in my mind. Something about his eyes, his face, his grin. It just wasn't right. It looked evil. I can still see it clear as day and can't recognize exactly what it was that set those alarms off. But whatever it was, it was plenty. Because I jumped off the ladder and ran out the door in one fell swoop. I sprinted all the way back home and was choking back tears when I burst through my front door. Mom was there when I came through and she could see that I was obviously out of sorts and tried to start calming me down. As I came back to my senses, I explained what had happened. My mom was concerned with how scared I was but mostly brushed it aside, telling me that I was just being silly and that whatever had happened probably wasn't as major as I made it feel. I sh** you not though. The same exact night, I was woken up at around 3am. It was my mom sitting on my bed 
and as I awoke, she pressed me to her chest and held me like a baby. I remember how she smelled and how tightly she held me, and I remember her tears hitting my cheek. Eventually, I saw out the window to the neighbor's house, which was surrounded by police and fire trucks. The neighbor dad had killed himself and his daughter in the attic after a long standoff with the police. There isn't a single doubt in my mind, nor my mother's, that that would have been me had I made it all the way into the attic. Even years later, I still get chills thinking about this. So, neighbor man, even in the afterlife, let's not meet again. Back when I lived in the rural Midwest, nearly a decade ago now, I lived in a house right off of the highway. My house was right between one town and another, almost nearly on the county line. Our house had a big circular driveway. If you drove in the driveway, you would be going straight towards our barn. If you curved right, you could pull into our garage. If you went past the garage, you would circle around in front of the house and pull out back where you started. Our house had two large double doors in the front, which we rarely used. We would mainly use the door that was inside the garage. One night, very late, our doorbell rang. My husband, my three-year-old daughter, and I were all asleep. It woke me up, and I thought that maybe I was dreaming. But then it rang again. That's when I woke my husband up. He thought that I was just hearing things, until it rang again. It was very dark outside, nearly pitch black, but we have a dusk to dawn light, so most of the driveway is pretty lit up. Unfortunately, you can't really see out the front doors unless you open the door to look out. You can open just one at a time, or you can open both of them by using two latch-like things that are in the top and the bottom of one of the doors. My husband gets up from bed. I closely follow behind him. He decides that he's going to open the door. I want to call the cops, but because we live on the county line, we know it's going to be a while before anyone can get here. He opens the door to a girl, maybe in her early 20s. She looks normal, except for the fact that she's standing at my door in the middle of the night. I look past her, and her car is pulled into my driveway just off of the road, but not quite up to the house, not around the circle either. She says that she needs to use the phone. She says her car battery died or something. She's not sure, but she can't get it to start. I told my husband, no fucking way. This is how horror movies start, and we offer to call the cops, which would be the county sheriff. She asks over and over to come in and make the call, but I'm not letting her in. We tell her we will call, and that's when she kind of stomps off. We watch her walk back to the car, maybe 50 feet away. I can see the car. I can see her. I call the cops. They say they'll be out as soon as they can, give me an estimate of about 15 minutes. Although, they don't sound very concerned, and at this point, I'm not really that concerned either. I mean... It's just a girl after all. She probably does have a dead battery. But that's when she heads to the trunk, pops it open. No lights come on. She rummages around in the trunk. Then, the driver's side door opens. Out steps a guy. Then back passenger door opens. Out steps one more guy. Now they're all rummaging around in the trunk. No lights on. All I can see is their silhouette. I can't hear a thing. Can't hear them talking. Can't quite tell what they're doing. But all in unison, they get back in the car. At this point, maybe five minutes have gone by, and I'm silently praying that the sheriff puts his foot on the gas and gets here quickly, but I know it's going to be another ten minutes or so. They just sit there, in the car, lights off, not moving. I can't see them when they're in the car, but obviously I know they're in there. I know they didn't get out of the car and walk past the house because they would have had to walk right under the dusk to dawn light. I would have seen them. I think I see the driver light up a smoke, but that part I'm not quite sure about. But then I see something else. Someone. Walking towards the car from the right of our property. Coming from the direction of our barn. It's another man. 
and I have no idea who this is. We don't have a neighbor for at least another mile around us. And this man is coming from the back of our property, which ends in a creek. He walks under the dust to dawn light, straight to the car, doesn't even look at the house, just strolls to the car and gets in. The car starts up without an issue, and they slowly back out of my driveway and make a turn to head north. The cops arrive about 10 minutes later, and at this point, I'm totally freaking out. They search around the property, but can't find a thing. Ask us if we got a license plate number, but they were parked too far away. Cops tell us to call back if the party happens to return. Sure, buddy. Thanks. My husband heads to our garage, grabs a shotgun from the locker, and we try to get back to sleep. Those people never came back. I don't know who they were, and I certainly don't know what they wanted, but I doubt it was just to make a phone call. Had it just been the three people in the car, I would have only been half as creeped out as I was. The fact that they had another person with their group just casually stroll out from behind our house to rejoin them added to my angst more than just a touch. But them effortlessly starting the car, after that being the stated reason for their presence in the first place, and simply pulling out into the night, really drove those chills into the depths of me. And that's actually what prompts me to say, creepy people in a car without a dead battery. I pray you don't come back, and I'll be happy to never meet you again. This is going to be long. Apologies in advance if it doesn't make much sense. I have panic attacks when I think about this, and struggle to put it all together. This happened back in 2021. I, a 27-year-old female, had just moved from Melbourne to rural Australia to live with my boyfriend, who was on a military posting at the army base, and also to escape Melbourne's insane COVID lockdowns. The town I moved to is pretty isolated, about four or five hours to reach any large city in any direction, but it was big enough with a few different suburbs surrounding the main area. Neither of us knew the area before moving here, and that's what led us to getting a house in a pretty sketchy part of town. I will try and explain the setup of the house, as this will be important for later. The house was old, with huge glass windows everywhere, including the entirety of the front of the house. Because of this, you could see into the kitchen, living room, and one of the unused bedrooms without coming down the driveway. There was an old metal fence to the left of the house, which was about a meter and a half tall, that went directly into the backyard and to the right of the house was a small path, hidden by overgrown bushes and plants from the front, with a locked gate the height of the house that led to the back semi-enclosed patio and back door. The path was right next to the kitchen window, but it was a window that you couldn't see out of when the kitchen light was on, although you could see in. When coming in through the back door from the patio, you would walk through the laundry with an adjacent bathroom, into the kitchen with our bedroom off to the left and a secondary bedroom directly next to ours. Our bed was on the wall that connected to the living room, which meant it looked right out to the backyard as it also had huge glass windows. My boyfriend had been out in the field for a week, so I was home alone. It was summer during this period and it was hot. The house had terrible AC, so I had been sleeping with the windows open and it even left the back door wide open on accident when falling asleep a couple of times. I've always felt safe in Australia, and I've lived mostly alone since I was 18, so I didn't have a huge issue with it. It comes to Friday, my fifth day alone, and I decided to walk into town for something to do. The walk took about an hour each way, and when I finally got home, I was looking forward to doing nothing besides getting out of the heat. I spent most of the afternoon and evening in the living room playing PlayStation and watching TV. I had heard a few noises down the side of the house on the path next to the kitchen, leading to the patio that evening, but the guy who lived next to us had a workshop of some kind, so I assumed it was just him tinkering around. Now, I'm one of those people who will lie in bed before they are ready to go to sleep, so I head to bed around 10pm 
and I was doing my nightly scroll of Let's Not Meet. But it was actually the stories and the content of them that stopped me and prompted me to get up out of bed and go close and lock the back door. The back door had a normal lock and then a reinforced deadbolt with a key screwed into the wall. About an hour or so later, still hearing the neighbor tinkering around occasionally, I decide that I'm ready to actually go to bed now. So I get up, start turning off all the lights, including the back patio light and kitchen light. I lie back down in bed again and am finishing up my mindless scrolling when I hear some noise once more, although this time it was a bit louder. I figured it was still the neighbor guy in his workshop or maybe some kind of animal. So I decided to put down my phone and drift off to sleep. After a couple of minutes, I hear a loud bang at the back door, and I instantly felt like everything went into slow motion. Almost instinctively, I knew that someone was kicking in the back door, but I also thought, there's no way this could be happening. Then came another bang, and another. It was so loud, and I felt like the entire house was shaking. I hear glass shattering, and then the banging continuing. Now this felt like it went on for an eternity, although I know now that it was no more than a few minutes. In my panic, after the second or third bang, thinking I could scare whoever it was off by pretending a man was there, I yelled out, OI, in the deepest voice I could. I slammed my bedroom door closed. I have no idea why I did any of that. I locked it and called 000 before pushing my bed up against the door. The banging is still going on when I'm connected to the police, and then it stops. There was nowhere to hide, so I was crouched down in the corner of the room near the edge of my bed. While on the phone to 000, I can hear someone start kicking the bedroom door. I'm screaming at this point. I don't remember what I was saying to the dispatcher or what they were saying to me, but I remember praying that the police would arrive before these intruders made their way inside the room. I hear sirens, the banging on the bedroom door stops, and that's when I see flashlights shining in through my bedroom window. Because I was so scared, and I couldn't understand what the operator was saying to me, I had no idea if the flashlights were whoever just kicked in my back door, or if it happened to be the police. I don't remember how I came to realize, but it was the police, and the next thing I remember I'm in the kitchen surrounded by 10 police officers, crying, doing my best to explain what had happened. I was absolutely inconsolable, so much so that the police had to use my boyfriend's army photos on the fridge to get his details to call the duty officer to get him to come home. Once I calmed down a bit and my boyfriend got home, I saw the back gate to the patio had been broken. The bedroom door was cracked. The back door had been kicked clean off its hinges with the deadbolt completely ripped out of the wall and the laundry window smashed. There were two sets of clear footprints on the door from where they had kicked the door in. I checked my phone. I called emergency services at 12.04 a.m. and had been on the phone with them for less than five minutes. All I can think that happened is that whoever these intruders were followed me back from my walk. They could easily see from the road that I was alone and were watching me on the path next to the kitchen for the entire evening. The noises that I thought were coming from the neighbor was actually them. And once I turned the lights off, they made their move. I don't think they anticipated the back door being so hard to break down, which is why they smashed the laundry window to unlock it. But they couldn't unlock it without the key. That's when they went back to kicking. That momentary delay is what saved me from whatever they were going to do. Whoever it was, they were never caught, and we ended up moving houses within the next few weeks. My boyfriend and I ended up splitting up, as he was regularly out in the field or on duty at night, and I couldn't handle being home alone at night anymore. I would panic, cry, and not sleep until the sun would come up, and it put too much strain on the relationship. It wasn't until later that I realized that I was experiencing PTSD. I now live back in my home city, in an apartment building that has 24-7 security and a billion cameras. 
I also have two dogs by my side every night. So to the guys who kicked in my back door and attempted to get into my room, I have no idea what you were going to do to me, but I'm very glad that we didn't have the pleasure of meeting. I'm a 30-year-old transgender male for the sake of my demeanor when this event occurred. At the time, I was a timid 19-year-old lesbian unleashed into this world immediately after graduation. I had just lost my job at McDonald's due to a massive flood taking out a lot of businesses in my area, and I had a girlfriend that lived 30 minutes away and I needed gas money to go see her, so I took a job offered to me by a family friend at a 24-7 gas station in the next town over. The shift that I was hired for was 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., graveyard, and I had never worked a night shift in my life, but I thought that it would be pretty cool to have little to no pressure other than to make sure the coffee was ready at 4 a.m. for the morning regulars. I was required to train on day shifts for the first couple of weeks to get accustomed to the operations. Throughout those weeks, I learned many of the ins and outs of what takes place on night shift, and I also learned the ins and outs of the people that hung around the place for hours, and there were quite a few of those. One sweet woman in particular, Melinda, would come in every morning before and after dropping her kids off at school, around lunchtime sometimes, actually buying us lunch, and in the evenings, when her husband was home, she'd come in for a couple of hours, considering she lived a couple of streets over. She was nice, and I started to enjoy her visits, and we all got along so well in the store, so it was never any trouble when she decided to hang out for a while. It was a fun atmosphere for the most part. It's finally time for me to work night shift, and I had my manager with me for the first few nights. I was actually taking her place on night shift because she couldn't do it anymore. She was nice, and I admit that I had a pretty big crush on her, so I didn't mind spending the time with her all night. And I learned when she worked night shift, Melinda would usually come by then as well. I had been working night shift alone for a couple of weeks, and some of those night shifts drug into the days when we were short-staffed. But again, I needed the money, so I didn't mind. Anyway, one night, I was doing my chores, scrubbing the hot dog rollers, setting coffee filters up for the rush, and mopping the entire store. While emptying my mop bucket, I heard the chime of the door and looked at my watch to see that it was about 2 a.m. Now, the time wasn't odd, but the fact that somebody stopped in at 2 a.m., that was. There typically wasn't anyone coming into the store until 4, and I was a little upset because I had just mopped the floor. But when I went out to see who it was, just as I headed out, I caught movement in the overhead mirror, the one designed to stop shoplifters, and that gave me pause. There was a man at the counter doing something with a money order machine, and upon looking again, I see that he has a knife. He was attempting to cut the wires. For what reason, I have no clue. While he was cutting, though, I heard him muttering, Where's Bonka? Where's Bonka? Over and over again. I knew that I could walk back to get to the phone in the office, but I didn't want this man to hear me. So I quietly pulled my phone out and texted Melinda to call the cops. I did my best to text quickly and explain the situation as best as I could describe. I'm thankful that she texted back almost immediately, saying, the police are on their way. I was glad to hear that, although it didn't stop me from freaking out with every second that passed. Before the police could get there, the man exited the shop, outside to the gas pumps, and threw all of the trash cans upside down, before trying to cut through the gas lines. That's when I took the opportunity to lock the front door in case he tried to get back in. Thank goodness I did, because the moment that he saw me at the window, he immediately made a beeline to the door, slamming his fist directly into it, cracking the window with the force. As he finishes his tirade, that's when the cops show up, and they place him in the back of the cop car while I explained everything that had just happened. Turns out, Bonka was a name that he called my manager, 
whose name was Bianca. He had become obsessed with her in the weeks prior, dropping in nightly and making her very uncomfortable, which explains why she was vacating the graveyard shift. She couldn't take it anymore. They knowingly threw a shy 19-year-old into this mess, and seeing me there instead of her was what turned that man's obsession into rage. I don't know whatever happened of the man. I do know that I didn't work at that gas station for much longer. While I like to think that I've grown and matured since this occurrence, I don't know if I'll ever truly be able to put this experience behind me. I don't work nights. I will never work in a position where I'm alone for long stretches of time. And that family friend that chose to employ me, knowing the situation they were going to drop me into without a heads up, well, I don't think I've called them a friend in many moons. Safe to say that this experience changed me. I don't know for good or for bad, but definitely a change. My older sister and I recently stumbled across a memory during our weekly visits with each other. We had just moved to a suburb, our first house in a decent, yet isolated part of town. She was 12, I was 7. Mom let us take our white German Shepherd for a walk, alone. I remember the sun was setting over the desert landscape, but we weren't worried. It was nice to be able to walk unsupervised down the street. We lavished in our freedom and took our time, letting Kodak, our dog, sniff and investigate everything that he wanted. We had just let him off the lead and were watching him chase a rabbit. I guess that's why we didn't hear the car pull up, nor the huge man that was creeping up behind us. Kodak was a ways off when suddenly he turned back and glanced at us. Like a streak of white lightning, he raced back towards us. He flew. I'm not sure if his feet touched earth, but he blasted past our waiting arms and landed on the large man behind us. We turned, and we saw Kodak latched onto the man's arm. The man, now on the ground, screaming, doing his best to detach this dog from him. Kodak was a big dog, with big teeth, and he was absolutely shredding this guy's arm. The man was eventually able to get Kodak off of him, and that's when our dog took a stance between us and the man. We apologized to the creep, not realizing what danger we were in. The man offered a shaky smile and told us we were good kids as he stumbled off back to his car. I remember seeing a length of rope on the ground, which now I can only assume that he had been holding. We looked at Kodak and he was growling profusely and continued to growl until we made it all the way home and he escorted us inside. That's when my sister looked at me and she said, don't tell mom or they'll have to put Kodak down for biting someone. I was so naive. We were so naive. We thought that we were protecting our pet, but in actuality, he had saved one or both of us from a terrible fate. Now much later, I learned that my hometown was in a heavy area of violent criminals and otherwise predators. Many of the surrounding towns and communities had passed legislation that wouldn't allow these people to live in their towns. So in turn, they lived in ours. No wonder our house was so cheap. As adults now, it's pretty clear for us to decipher what that man's intentions were. And to say that I'm glad Kodak was there to put those plans to a halt would be an understatement of a lifetime. Kodak passed about five years later. We buried him in the backyard and planted a tree over him. Our mother still lives in that same house, and I visit that tree every time I'm over there to see her, making sure to tell Kodak that we still remember how good of a boy he was. I'm going to go all the way back with this story. It happened when I was about five and my best friend was six. I think one of the scariest elements of this story is that it took place at our elementary school, a place where all kids should feel safe. Quick school layout. The building was L-shaped, 
the short end of the building was not in use at the moment, and cars could stop to the right of the L, which would be in full view of the schoolyard, or behind the short part of the building, which would have been mostly obscured. The road was pretty much in a square right around the school, but only in the aforementioned places would cars be able to pull over. We were at school one day, and I remember my friend doing something that made me angry. She grabbed my colorful pens without asking. Needless to say, I wanted revenge. Shortly after recess started that day, I saw my best friend walking towards the back of the short building, and I followed her, thinking that she was going to do something fun. When I rounded the corner, I saw a man in a car giving her candy through the open passenger door. Well, at least he was trying to. My childish mind thought, why doesn't that guy just step out and give her the candy? Now he's holding it just outside of her reach, and she's going to have to climb in the car to get it. His seat's going to get all messy. My friend had one knee on the car seat, reaching for the candy now. I suddenly realized that this was the perfect time for my revenge. I was going to stop her from getting that candy. So I yelled at her that she wasn't allowed to be this close to the road, knowing that we'd get in heaps of trouble if caught near the road instead of being on the playground, and that I was going to tell on her. This caused her to jolt back, and she ran away from the car, back towards the school ground, taunting me with the fact that a passerby thought she was so pretty that he wanted to give her candy, but not me. Apparently a teacher saw me walk towards the road and was on her way to fetch me, so she was just around the corner from us when my friend started to tease me. The teacher heard what was said and quickly ran the last few steps towards us, frantically asking, Did anyone get in the car? Did you see any classmates getting into a car? She was clearly panicked, and the car was long gone by now, having driven off when I yelled at my friend. My friend answered no, the nice man just wanted to give me some candy, and that my name said she'd tell on me, so we ran back. I really wanted that candy. Are we in trouble now? The teacher escorted us inside, had all the other teachers count heads, and luckily everyone was there. We talked to the police that were called, though neither me nor my friend knew what the matter was at this point, until her parents came to fetch her and gave her a stern talking to about accepting candy from strangers, saying things like, we've talked about this, and we have plenty of candy at home. My mom was proud of me because she thought I listened to the stranger danger talks and protected my friend. I didn't take my opportunity to correct her. A few years ago, my best friend and I were talking about our old school, and this day actually came up. We both just realized that if I hadn't been so obsessed with those pens, or if she had asked before taking them, that she could have been kidnapped and suffered a pretty bad fate. She couldn't believe how stupid she was for thinking that a random guy would really offer candy to kids from his car, especially since her parents had warned her about strangers before. I just felt embarrassed for not recognizing the situation from the talks that my parents gave me, and being so focused on getting revenge on her. It took me a while longer to fully realize just what could have happened to her. I don't know if the guy was ever arrested or did anything else, and after this incident, my school started permanently posting a teacher as a lookout near the road. As far as I know, there were no more incidents at that school, and it was never really spoken of again. The official reason for the lookout teacher was to prevent students from running out onto the road and getting hit by a car. When I drove past last year, they had put a fence all around the school. I'm guessing it's because they finally realized a fence is cheaper than paying a teacher an hour a day to just stand around. To the guy who probably wanted to try to kidnap my best friend in broad daylight, I can only hope that you never got your hands on any other child trying to use those same tactics. This happened to me about 20 years ago. I was only 9 at the time, but my parents have told me their side of the story on a bunch of different occasions, and that's helped me connect the dots. My parents are both biologists. They met at work, and from there, 
its history. The place where they worked at the time was a government building dedicated to biology research, used in government projects turned towards the public. Meaning, they were the ones studying the environment and making environmental protection laws around their studies. This being a massive, old government building, it always had a security guard present, both day and night. During the day, these security guards would mostly just stay at reception to greet people, but at night, they would go do their rounds and make sure there were no intruders on the premises because of all the science equipment and computers kept in the building. One of these guards is my let's not meet guy. Initially, he seemed like the nicest person. He was really nice to me, and frankly, all the memories I have from him before this were really pleasant. He would greet me and talk to me in the nicest way every time my parents brought me to work. He would make me paper planes, which he was surprisingly good at, and throw them around with me, and he would stay with me at reception on the days my parents had to work into the evening. Obviously, for me, that would get really boring really, really fast so he'd keep me company and do his best to entertain me. Mostly we would talk, play with the paper planes, and watch TV. It all seemed nice enough. Nice enough for my parents to trust him with me, which was probably their biggest mistake. One night, my parents had to work even later than usual. I think it was around 10 p.m., and they were still at it. So this guy, who was on the night shift, decided to take me around the building with him to do his rounds. We began on the top floor, checking all the rooms and the exterior part of the roof. Every room was so dark that I'd always stay a little bit behind and wait for him to turn on the lights. Then we stepped down to the second floor, where my parents' office and labs were. We checked the opposite side of the building, going into labs with massive extractors, microscopes, and every kind of science equipment that you might think of. We walked down the stairs to the first floor where most of the administration rooms were. I still remember seeing some maps on the walls and embalmed fish everywhere serving as decorations. First floor was all clear, so it was time to check the two basement levels. I thought it would have made sense to check the labs on the right side first, as the left side had a flight of stairs at the end leading up to where my parents were. But for some reason, he decided that we'd go check that side first. We checked all the labs, but I noticed that his pace was accelerating, and he was even starting to look and sound happier, excited even. Once again, we checked all of the labs, all the corners, from one end to the other, turning the lights on ahead of us and turning them off behind us when we left. When we got to the last area, he turned all the lights on, and we went inside. There were three separate offices on each side of the lab, and on the first one, he hurried towards the printer, opened it up, took out two pieces of paper, and made two quick paper planes. But if I recall correctly, that's when everything changed. He picked up one of the planes, went outside of the office, and threw it towards the end of the room. Then he told me the one he just threw was mine and that we could go throw them around in there. I ran to the other side of the room to pick up my plane, excited to play with it, when suddenly the lights went off. When I turned around to check what was happening, I saw him exiting out of the lab door, turning the lights off and locking the door behind him. I ran to the door, punched it and kicked it while screaming for him to open panic taking over me because of just how scared I was of being in the dark at that time. Through the glass on the door, I could see him scurrying away in the corridors, turning the lights off as he went, disappearing after turning a corner. I'm pretty sure that everything I felt and every shadow and creepy monster I saw in there while waiting was part of my imagination because of how scared I was. I balled up against a corner and could see shadows moving around me in the dark. All I could do was cry, lost, without knowing what was happening, and why that guard was doing what he was doing. My parents finished work eventually, and when they did, they packed up their things and made their way to the lobby to pick me up and head home. 
When they got there, the security guard was at reception, but I was nowhere to be found. They panicked, of course, must have shouted a hundred different cuss words at the guy, and I'm not sure how my dad didn't murder him right then and there. But when they first asked the guy where the hell I was and what he had done with me, he simply said that he had gone to do the rounds with me, and I must have gotten lost somewhere. This is a building that would take about an hour and a half to check from top to bottom, even if you're rushing. So the must have gotten lost somewhere isn't exactly helpful. My parents looked for hours before they found me. It was only when I saw a far off light at the end of the corridors leading to the lab that I was in that I got the courage to stand up, rush towards the door, and begin punching it as hard as I could. They finally found me there and made the guard unlock the door to get me out. I don't really remember sleeping that night, and if I did, it must have been out of exhaustion. But I know I made my mom stay in the bedroom with me the entire night. Of course my parents made a complaint against the guard, and when they did, the guy started being investigated. He was quickly fired and arrested, although very little of that had to do with me. He didn't get fired for locking me away where he probably hoped that no one would find me, but he was fired because he had been partnered up with other criminals to steal computers and equipment from the building, selling the computers along with the information held on the hard drives for profit. By then, he had stolen a lot of old computers without anyone realizing, and who knows what his plans were for me that evening. I'm not convinced that locking a crying child in the middle of the darkness, hidden away in some room, is exactly the most normal behavior if you're not trying to conceal them and then come get them later when everyone is left, perhaps as an effort to sell them off as part of your product. Luckily, he never had the chance to do that. I also really hope that he never got to do that with any other kid. This story picks up around 2008. I'm a guy and was 23 at the time that this all began. I remember it being the weekend and an old high school friend had reconnected with me online. So we decided to go grab a beer at a bar in his hometown, which happened to be the same town that I went to college in. It was my turn to get the round. So I went up to the bar of this dim, dirty dive bar and asked for a bucket of beers. As I was waiting for my beers, a girl approached me. Let's call her Jane. Hey, do you remember me? She was acting flirtatious out the gate. I really didn't know or couldn't remember meeting her, so I said something like, I'm sorry, I talk to a lot of people at my job. Can you refresh my memory? She stated that she took a class with me and worked with me on a group project. Although, I still had no idea who she was, but she knew my name and the class that we had supposedly taken together. I wasn't really interested in talking to her, so I politely said, well, it was nice seeing you again, and went back to my friend at the table. I ended up leaving about an hour later to head home. I remember that I took a shower and was getting ready to go to bed. I checked my phone before climbing into my sheets to see that an unknown number had called me two times, plus texted, and left me a voicemail during the time that I was in the shower. The text was from Jane, saying that it was great seeing me, and that I looked cute, or something along those lines. Once again, very flirtatious. I again wasn't going to lead a girl on, so I responded politely, saying that it was cool seeing her as well. I was a little weirded out though, because I didn't give her my phone number at the bar. I wrote this off, thinking that maybe she had it on an old list if she were in my class. When I woke up, I had over 10 texts sent to me, inviting me over to hook up. It was point blank, literally just telling me to come over. I laughed it off at first and was kind of flattered, but my thought was, man, she must have drank a lot that night. I didn't respond as I felt it would have been awkward. Then the real shit begins. I worked in an office where I could not have my cell phone out, and it's a very professional environment. On my break one afternoon, I powered my phone on to see 19 missed calls, 25 texts, 
and approximately 10 voicemails. I freaked out as I thought that there was an emergency, but everything on the phone was from Jane. These messages went from hellos to sexual advances, to anger, questioning why I'm not answering, to sobbing and sorries, to threats of unaliving herself if I don't respond. I was beyond freaked out, but I texted anyway to see if she was okay or if she truly needed help. She responded to me as if it was the greatest day of her life hearing from me. I then let her know that I felt her messages were inappropriate and that I didn't want to give her any feelings that I wanted to date her. I was young and wanted to experience dating, but not with her. From the beginning, this just seemed so odd to me. She began to go through cycles of anger, seduction, sadness, happiness, the whole gamut. I began getting 40 plus calls and messages a day. I decided that it would be best to just stop responding at this point. This went on for over a week, day and night calls and messages. Then one message caught my eye. She happened to mention where I worked. I never told her this. I began to get paranoid when leaving work, thinking that she was following me. I'd drive around for a while before heading home from work regularly, just to test out if anybody was following me through the streets. I remember sending her one last message, stating that if she contacted me again, I would call the police. At the time, I would have had to pay a fee to my cell phone provider to have a number blocked from contacting me. I wasn't doing as well financially then as I am now, so I resisted that move. But after sending the message, threatening to call the authorities if I heard anything more from her, I never did hear anything more from her. But those days and weeks after this interaction absolutely stuck with me. The fear of being followed home or having her catch me when I was out all gave me chills. There were a few times that I had that someone's watching me feeling when I was at the bar or gym. And one time I think I saw her standing outside of my office building, but now, given the time that has passed, I don't know if that was just my worry-fueled imagination or what. I still don't remember her from that class we took together, don't know how she knew all she did about me, don't know if she was ever really a threat to me or even to herself. But I know that even after all this time has passed, it's probably still not enough for me to ever want to meet her again. Jane, for all intents and purposes, I hope that you're well, and hope that you stay far away from me. So I'm a 24-year-old female living in Los Angeles, California. I left my home state when I was 18 and moved out west for school. I can easily say that it's been one of the better choices of my life. After college, I was lucky enough to find myself a job that pays relatively well for where I live. But after several years of living with multiple roommates and sharing a living space with others, I decided that I was done with that and I've prioritized living on my own ever since. I have a great one bedroom apartment that I love although I don't live in the glitziest or safest part of the city. This is what leads me to my story that actually just unfolded a few nights ago. I was coming home later than usual from work, probably around 11.30 p.m. As I pull into the parking lot of my complex, I head for my assigned spot, and as I pull in, I notice a guy three or four spots away from me, appearing to be loading or unloading things from his car. He looked a bit older than me, dressed like he had just gotten done camping or something. Parka-style jacket, hiking boots, five o'clock shadow. As I get out, I can already feel his eyes on me as I lock up my car and begin heading for the front door. But before I get too far away, he calls out, Hey! And says, You've got a headlight out. This is something that I knew already but I replied that I hadn't had time to get to it and thank him for the heads up. As I turn to leave again, he says, well, I can probably take care of that for you, if you want. Again, I stop and say, no thanks, I'll get to it when I do, 
and it's not that big of a deal. But at this point, I can feel that he's not ready for our interaction to be done. He attempts to make small talk, which, given the hour of the night, felt a little off-putting on its own. And while I'm used to guys trying to flirt or hit on me, not tooting my own horn here, it's just something that women have to deal with, he wasn't really doing that. He was asking more awkward style questions. Have you lived here long? What's the community like? Is there anywhere to explore around here? But the one that stuck out most was, what time does the front door lock? This man asked vague enough questions that one could assume that he had just moved in, but he never said that. And that door question was particularly strange because at that moment, the front security door leading into the building had a broken lock. This is something that both myself and other tenants had shared with the building manager, but nothing had been done about it yet. The door would open and shut with a loud click, so it might sound as if it were bolted shut. But one pull would tell you differently. Now, this dude was sketching me out, so I didn't want to be super forthcoming with any response, really. But by the time his last question hit, I decided that it was time for me to head inside. I excused myself as smoothly as I could and headed for the door. Once I was sure that he wasn't following behind me, I held out my key as if I were having to unlock the door, and as securely as I could, I shut it behind me. Now, I live on the first floor, and my apartment windows face the parking lot. Hold on to that for the time being. Once I get to my own front door, I quietly listen to hear if anybody is messing with the door in the lobby. I don't hear a thing, so I open my door and quickly shut and lock it behind me. My next instinct, like most people, is to flick on the lights in my dark apartment. But before my hand hits the switch, I get this cold feeling. A feeling that was instant and told me, hold off on the lights for a second. Instead, I grab my phone. Now, the building that I'm in is equipped with a communal version of a ring doorbell. It sits at the main entryway and serves as a way to see who is at the door before any of us residents buzz someone in, when the door is locked at least. When I open the app up, I can't help but notice that same strange man standing about 20 feet from the door, just staring up at the building. It was an odd sight, but it got me wondering what exactly he was doing, because he stood completely still and looked as if he were a statue like he was waiting for something. Well, as a woman, you have to be more aware or more ready to connect the dots or whatever you want to call it compared to our male counterparts. My mind jumps from his outwardly strange demeanor to a realization of what he actually is doing. This man saw me park in front of my building. He watched me walk into the building. And now, I believe that he was waiting to see if he could figure out which apartment was actually mine. I froze and kept my eyes fixed on my phone. He kept his eyes fixed on the building, and we kind of just sat in the stalemate for about five or so minutes. Like I said, I live on the first floor, and while my windows aren't exactly on the ground level, they are only ten or so feet above the ground and don't have any sort of bars or deterrent on them so I for sure wasn't about to key this guy in on where I stayed. After a little while, it seems like dude just kind of gave up. He took a few steps towards the door, peeked in through the glass entryway, but thankfully, never touched the door handle. He turned and walked back towards where his car was parked, and while it was only a matter of moments between him staring in and walking off, it was easily the most unsettling part of this interaction. I never saw his car drive by the camera towards the exit of the lot, but after gaining a little courage to look out the window, the car was no longer in the spot that it was when I pulled in. While this story might not resonate with most people as being the most creepy, I wanted to share this more as a precautionary tale. I'm not sure why this guy was so interested in where I lived, but it didn't give me a good feeling. And when that sensation hit my gut, 
telling me to not turn on my lights. I think that was something worth listening to. So, to anyone that hears this, I hope that it at least gives you something to ponder in terms of not broadcasting to everybody, especially those that may not need to know where you choose to lay your head. Thanks for listening. In 2018, I lived with my partner and my German Shepherd in the Humboldt Park neighborhood of Chicago. I was 33 years old at the time, and our apartment was a fourth floor walk-up unit. Very typical low-budget Chicago rental in an up-and-coming neighborhood. The layout of our building is going to matter to this story. Our building had a total of 12 units, mine, and the three below me, and had a shared front entrance and the other eight units were through a second entrance. All 12 apartments had connected back porches and stairs that shared a walkway to a rear gate, which led down to an alley. From the front stairwell, there are windows on each landing to the back porches, so you can see the back door of my apartment when standing at the front door through that window. We had good relations with our neighbors especially those that lived directly below us and shared our front door. This was a thing that saved all three of us, my partner, my dog, and myself. My partner was in a touring band at the time and would leave for weekends or even weeks at a time. And it was a scary thing for me because I was assaulted and stalked by an ex in my teens and 20s. And I still have the PTSD from it. I was always worried that something would tip off my ex, and he'd start stalking me again. A little less than a month before our two-week tour my partner had scheduled, I received a creepy Facebook message from that stalker ex from yet another new account. About a week after that, my car was broken into. The glove box was emptied, things were thrown around, but the only thing that was taken was a bag of dog treats. I had about $20 worth of change in the compartment between the seats, and they left the money. I was on high alert at that point, and very scared about the time that I'd be alone during the tour. My partner was kind of irritated with me and the situation, and felt that it was too last minute to cancel, especially over what amounted to a bad feeling and a few isolated things that weren't direct threats. And truthfully, car break-ins are very common in Chicago. It's happened to me like 15 times, and the police usually do the reports over the phone, don't even come to the scene. What I found really strange was that the thief didn't take the money though. My partner left for his tour, and I set up cameras and bought door braces for my front and back doors. I became completely nocturnal, unable to sleep at night. My poor dog developed diarrhea maybe because she was picking up on my own stress levels. It meant that I was taking her down all four flights of stairs for her to go blast her bowels six or seven times a night. I had the distinct prickly, crawling sensation of being watched when I would take her out, but I couldn't tell what was genuine and what was my own fear and paranoia. My dog's tummy issues lasted an unusually long time, maybe four or five days. I was going in and out of the main door a lot, feeling scared, and I noticed that some of my neighbors wouldn't pull the door all the way closed, closed enough that the lock would engage. I mentioned this to my downstairs neighbor one day, including that I was extra careful because of the stalker. He was supportive, said he'd mention it to the other neighbors if he saw them, and I noticed that the door was locked more frequently after that. My partner came home at about 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning. At about 8.30 a.m. that morning, my first floor neighbor's place was burglarized. The neighbor was a metalhead dude who collected instruments, sold weed and psychedelics, and lived alone. I guess he went out for breakfast, and he left his door unlocked while he was gone. Someone had come in, eaten the leftovers in his fridge, took a coat and a pair of boots, and left a filthy coat and a pair of boots in exchange. They took his college diploma, but left $500 in the same cabinet. They left all the expensive musical instruments and mixing equipment, left the drugs, 
but did take a set of keys. The keys were to the first floor apartment, and a master key for the front door and the back gate. My neighbors ran into each other right after the break-in, and the second floor neighbor said that Metalhead Dude should probably come tell me what was going on, due to the whole stalker thing. So Metalhead Neighbor did just that, came to find me, and let me know what had happened. My partner had just gotten home from his tour when he knocked at the front door. I jumped out of my skin, but looked through the peephole, recognized the neighbor, and the three of us stood on the stairs at my front door while he told us about the break-in. We jabber-jawed for a while, maybe 15, 20 minutes. While we were talking, we heard the front door open and close below us, but thought nothing of it. That's when we saw a man climbing up my back porch steps, headed straight for my back door, through the window. There was no other apartment he could have been going to, and he had to walk past all 11 more accessible units on his way to mine. This was not my stalker, nor did I recognize him, but his image is now burned in my mind. He was wearing flashy black and white high top sneakers not the one stolen from downstairs. His black coat was oversized and hanging from his shoulders. We locked eyes through the window and he froze halfway up the stairs to my back porch. He slowly took a cell phone from his pocket and called someone as he even more slowly turned around halfway up the steps. He walked back down the stairs in an artificially slow motion like he was pretending to be nonchalant, and then bolted into a sprint as soon as he hit the porch below mine. My neighbor ran downstairs and dialed 911. My partner and I ran through the apartment to the back porch and saw a sedan and a windowless van pull out from the sketchy building two doors down. Both cars floored it out of the alley. We didn't get the plates. But the cop said it wouldn't have mattered. There wasn't any crime committed and nothing concrete to justify stopping them. They very condescendingly explained this to me as they took my statement later. My neighbor is the one who actually made the call and has the police report. My partner and I were just considered witnesses. For a long time, the thing that scared me the most happened to be the tool that my neighbor found when he went running downstairs. It was a two-by-four piece of wood cut to about two feet in length but about six inches of it had been made into a handle. It looked like a paddle, and for a long time I couldn't figure out what it was, but now I'm pretty sure it was a ram for the door jam or locks. When I looked at my door afterward, it looked like the frame had been repaired, like it had been broken open before. It seems like they used the one master key to place their ram, get somebody at the back door to catch me if I tried to run out that way, and somebody else was going to come back around since they only had one key, and they'd break in my front door to go forward with whatever they had planned. When we caught them before they could catch me unaware, it seems like they aborted the plan. I suspect they'd been watching me, especially while I was taking out my dog, and figured that I was alone. It was pure coincidence that my partner had gotten home just 30 minutes before all of this. I feel that we all could have been horribly injured, or worse, had we been trapped inside and they had gotten the jump on us. Nothing else really came of this, except that my landlord refused to change the locks, although he did agree to let us out of our lease. I moved out of Chicago, and now I've added a younger dog that I'm training to do some bite work. My house is surrounded by cameras and floodlights and wingnut neighbors. So, whoever was on my back porch, and whatever you had planned, let's not meet. I've never posted to this subreddit before, but after working with authorities, I finally feel safe enough to share my story. For context, I'm a 20-year-old female and I started an OnlyFans account over the summer to support myself through school. And things were great until I posted my Amazon wishlist. 
Amazon doesn't release your address to people who gift you items, but third-party sellers can. And I believe that that's where I went wrong. By the way, not trying to promote it here. This is a very frightening story, and I felt like it should be shared. In late July, I got a puppy. And one evening, around 2 a.m., I took him outside to go to the bathroom. While he was doing his business, I happened to notice a car parked outside my family home. I saw a figure in the car, but I couldn't really make out their face because it was pitch black. But from the way they were facing and the position of the car, it certainly felt like they were looking at me. Feeling a bit uneasy, I picked up my puppy to take him back inside. And once I started to move, that car that was parked inched towards my driveway. I sprinted back inside and locked the door, expecting whoever it was in the car to approach the house, but no knock ever came. The next morning, I went to check the mail, and I found that there was an envelope inside addressed to my only fan's name with about 50 bucks in it, but no note. I was currently still at home with my parents, who had no idea about my only fan's account, so I didn't want to have to explain that so I just kept it to myself. A few weeks later, I moved back to my college town to get ready for school. At this time, I had stopped posting for the time being until I could figure out how that person got my address. I've watched enough crime shows to know there's a possibility that I could be in danger. I live in a duplex with a gated parking lot for reference. One morning, I was planning on vlogging my trip to Target because I was planning on starting a YouTube channel in the near future, since OnlyFans now felt unsafe. When I got to my car, I realized that it had been ransacked, and my vlogging camera was now missing. I know, it's my fault for leaving it in my car, but I was using it the night before, and since I lived in a gated area, I didn't think that it would be unsafe. It wasn't in plain sight either. I had it hidden in my glove box. I used that camera to film my content, and the SD card inside had all of my unreleased photos and videos. I know that they stole it just for the SD card, but this is where the story gets weird. There are cameras outside in the parking lot, so we were able to watch this person break into my car and find the camera. They didn't happen to touch any of the other seven cars in the lot. It seemed like they knew which car was mine, which suggests they had been watching me for a while. After they got the camera, they walked around the duplex until stopping near my window. My bedroom faces an outside street, and my blinds happen to be broken, so it's fairly easy to see in. I have a curtain, but it doesn't cover my window all the way. That's when we saw that this person watched me sleep for nearly an hour or so using the camera they had just pilfered from my car to do the recording. I have no idea why they didn't try to break in, but I thank God that they didn't. This person, whoever it was, then sold the camera to a pawn shop, and since I knew the serial number, the police were able to find it. When I got it back, the camera was still in perfect working order, but predictably, the SD card was missing. I believe the police are still trying to track that person down, but I broke my lease and moved to a new place, so hopefully that will keep me safe. I no longer create content, no longer do I want to have a YouTube following, or literally any type of following now. Part of me wishes that I were more creative and had found a way to make money for school in a different way, instead of putting myself out there the way that I did. But a bigger part of me? Wishes that online creeps would just stay online and away from me in real life. So a little background information before we start. My father was in the army for 21 years. He retired and moved to a very small town in central Florida. He got bored after a couple of years and even though we didn't need the money between his retirement and what my mom was making as a bookkeeper slash accountant, he wanted to go back to work. 
he started working at various gas stations. And it being a small town, the owners wouldn't care if I came along and helped him out with stocking the coolers or even running the register, so long as I didn't sell any beer or smokes. This all took place in the late 80s and early 90s. The actual story that I'm going to tell took place in 1990, and I remember the date well because it was shortly after my birthday, and being 15 in Florida, I had just gotten my learner's permit. My dad would let me drive him to and from work just to get some experience on the road during both the day and night. I was sitting in my usual spot at a table in the gas station that was set up along the windows. I had a book in hand, feet propped up, and a Mountain Dew on the table, along with some snacks. I would generally spend most of my evening that way, reading books, getting up to run the register, or stock the cooler at different times. I remember glancing up because something caught my attention that was unusual. I realized that it was a lady walking up to our parking lot from the direction of the interstate. The gas station was right on I-75 if that helps. This in itself was pretty strange, because where we were located, you didn't get many people walking, and definitely not walking from the direction of the interstate. I figured she had broken down somewhere and was coming to use the phone to call for a tow truck or something along those lines, but I was completely wrong. She walked into the store, looked around for a few minutes, and that's when I remember getting this strange and creepy feeling about her. She walked up next to the counter and began telling my dad this story about how she had become stranded and needed a ride up to the next big town up north from us. Ocala was the town. This is important. My dad lets her know that he's working and there's no way that he can take her. That's when she turns her focus to me. And while she's looking away from him, my dad catches my eye and subtly shakes his head no. I was confused for a moment, but then she turns back to my father and points at me, asking if I can take her. My dad responded back that I only had a learner's permit and wouldn't be able to drive her anywhere and then drive back. Now, normally I would have done it, even though it was illegal because I'd done it a few times before already. But I didn't argue with my dad, since this was completely out of character for him. He was normally chatty with the customers, but for whatever reason, he was almost curt and dismissive of her. Turns out, he had that bad vibe about her from the moment that he had seen her walking up the drive. Well, she cusses him up and down for a minute, and he basically tells her to get out of the store. She slammed the door open. I thought the glass was going to break from how hard she had slammed it. And then she stalks out of the store, back down the driveway. I keep an eye on her as she walks, and continue to watch as she makes her way back up to the interstate and starts up the northbound ramp, walking off into the night. Almost a year passes. I'm in my bedroom one night, less than a week before my 16th birthday. I hear my dad yelling from downstairs, Son, get down here and look at this. I quickly run down to the living room and see my dad pointing at the TV. There's a mugshot on the TV of a woman, and it only took me a moment to unscramble my brain and realize that I recognized the photo. It's of that woman that came into the gas station that one evening. Turns out that lady was a woman named Eileen Warnos. A quick Google search will tell you that I almost willingly gave a car ride to one of, if not the only female serial murderer known in the United States that night. She had been arrested at some bar in early 1991 on a weapons charge from several years back. But within a week of being in custody, she confessed to killing seven different men in the years leading up to this. She was convicted of first-degree murder about a year later and put to death in the early 2000s. It's been 33 years, and even now I still have nightmares about what could have happened that night. I was ready to just get out on the road, maybe do a good deed for this woman while I was at it, 
but I'm thankful for the fact that my father both had and paid attention to that unsettled feeling in him and was unwilling to let his son walk out the door with that strange woman. No telling what the ending would have been. This story occurred back in 2017. Due to a multitude of factors, including a recent death of a close friend, I was unbearably depressed at this time in my life. For that reason, my family flew across the country to visit me in LA, where I live. We thought it would be nice to visit the historic Catalina Island. When we arrived, it became apparent to us that it was the off-season. Being in late November, the weather was cold, and as a result, the island was nearly empty, besides locals and a few straggling tourists such as ourselves. Our first priority was to ditch our luggage so that we could explore this island. So we immediately checked into our motel, although that word hardly does this place justice. I call it a motel because all the doors to the rooms exited to the outside, but in actuality, our room was one of 20, maybe 30 quaint looking guest cabins arranged in sort of a horseshoe shape around a walkway, with rooms finding their way to either side of the path. The entrance to the motel was essentially one of the points of the horseshoe, and if you walked dead straight, you'd reach the room that we were given. Basically on the corner, before you have to go right to go further into the horseshoe. So from our room, one path led back to the street, the other further into the secluded maze of rooms. I encourage you to stay with me on this. After a day of exploring and having just finished dinner, it was time for the cold, dark walk back to the room. Catalina Island is a decent distance from the mainland, and let me just say, it gets dark. Similarly dark was my headspace after the dinner conversation, took a left-hand turn, and my overwhelming depression got the best of me. I pulled my black hoodie tighter over my freezing ears and walked ahead of my parents to the room, telling them I just needed to go to sleep. And I did immediately. Depression sometimes makes that easy. I was already losing consciousness as they entered after me, drifting off without so much as a good night. Later on, though, I woke up to my mom saying my name. A harsh whisper. The room had two beds. My parents' bed, closer to the door, and mine, further into the room. My mom's voice cut through the silence again. She sounded concerned this time. I didn't blame her, considering my mental state. Groggily, I rolled over. What? I asked. As my eyes adjusted to the dim moonlight coming in through the curtains, I saw her turn to face me. She was surprised to see me in bed. Her eyes got wide. If I'm in my bed, who was she talking to? We both looked back to where she was previously looking to see a hooded figure in all black standing over their bed. Now, I know the context that you're listening to the story in. You know that something creepy is going to happen. But I have to underline just how horrifically startling it is to be on an island in the middle of the ocean and wake up to see a hooded stranger looming over you. This particular moment seemed to last a lifetime. Life isn't like the movies, though, where characters unleash a blood-curdling scream. Sometimes, the only thing that comes out is something panicked and guttural. My mom's words became low and severe as she said my dad's name in a dire voice that I don't think I'd ever heard her use before. Then the hooded figure did something so bizarre and unsettling. It didn't advance towards us, but instead crouched in the corner near where it stood. The way it crouched was so absolutely unexpected, even in regards to this already unexpected situation that it terrified me. 
It seemed almost animalistic. I knew two things. The hooded figure had been standing over us sleeping, and it's not acting in any sort of way that I can understand. As opposed to the infinite moment of this figure standing over us mere seconds ago, the series of events that unfolded when my hulking ex-military dad woke up happened in only an instant. Suddenly, we were out the door, not knowing which way the intruder went. My mom was screaming, get him, get him. My dad was running down one path of the horseshoe, further into the hotel, shouting through sheer adrenaline, I'm going to and kill you. I ran down the other path towards the street. When I got there, not one sign of the intruder, but it became suspiciously quiet behind me. I ran back to the room to find my dad quietly walking back, his head low. He gets really close to me and I hear him say, it's a kid. It's a fucking kid. The explanation some young teen, tall and lanky as I am, wearing all black including a black hoodie, went into the wrong room. Our room. The one time my parents just so happened to forget to lock the door. My mom woke up when he entered, and seeing a tall person in a black hoodie, thought it was me, assumedly leaving the room in a depressive episode. And when the hooded figure crouched, that was him realizing his mistake, and then panicking. He was scared of us. As I got back to the room, my mom walked out and hugs this kid, who's now crying his eyes out. And let's be real, I would be too if a massive ex-soldier was sprinting after me with murder in his eyes. So, to the now traumatized kid from Catalina Island, I look forward to reading your Let's Not Meet of the same event, only from your perspective. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently stumbling upon this sub, I finally felt a place I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a good shiver. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon and felt comfortable in the woods and have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and our two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. I've included the coordinates of our campsite, which we found to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need the privacy since they are intimidating to other dog owners and can get loud when spooked. It was not an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off of a U.S. Forest Service road that had flat ground, full trees, and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from me and my wife's tent. We had our boy German Shepherd, his name is Guts, sleep with her in her tent. That whole first night though, neither my wife nor I could find sleep. We both heard footsteps, and they were heavy, not like typical forest critters scampering around the night. I was well armed because, well, I was paranoid. I had read recently, before departing, about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection, and that is why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless, and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided was a deer or maybe some elk. Day 2 morning. We go for a walk down the road, and maybe 300 feet away, I see an abandoned road where a rusted gatepost was covered in vegetation. Something of blue color caught my eye, and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. 
My heart begins to race because I think it's another family camping like us, and he's going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So I chase after him as fast as I can, and the rest of my family follows. He stops after 20 feet into the road and me yelling his name, but I have covered just enough distance to see that there is nobody there, but there is something off about the sight. I yell, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog, but I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the sight conditions were. As I get closer, I know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table. But every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed and torn from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, puzzled why anyone would leave all their camping gear behind including an expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry, and animals got to the rest, as the only logical explanation. Still, a propane tank and cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon begins to roll in, me and my daughter are playing bocce ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I do not have a direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden, I see Guts make a mad dash straight towards her. Normally, he would always be with me, unless he is called over and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention, and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there, and my wife starts jogging at me. That's when I draw my pistol. Guts has continued his sprint into the forest another 100 feet before I call him, and he stops. My other dog, Leah, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I've had her for seven years now, and this was the first time in her life that she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is up front bossing everything in her path, and then pauses to look to see where we are before continuing. I asked my wife what happened, and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden, I felt every hair on my neck raise. I know someone was watching me, and that's when I saw Guts running towards me. I just got up and moved towards you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, no broken branches, nothing to point to what and where something went. We decide that we're spending one more night since it's now too late to pack up and drive, but we will all be in the big tent tonight. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used an empty bean can and some coins and keys from our truck and zip tied it so anything hitting the rope would give a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing I have done with a rope that was so old and brown that I didn't see it at first. It was broken and only a few pieces remained, but sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, eight to 10 inches off the ground, and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt someone has stayed here before and put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree I am, maybe 10 or 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia had now reached a new height, but I had to make sure the girls felt we were safe, and at the time, the only thing I could think of was that when evening came around, I made them sit in the truck, and I fired a clip of my forty-five into the dirt. 
as a signal to whatever was out there, that we were armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that now knows that we have two wolves with us and were armed, basically making us too risky to be any sort of target. That way we could sleep safely that night. That evening though, we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left at first light the next morning. Fast forward to today, and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 Hunted documentary. I noticed the cluster smack dab close to where we camped that weekend, and a flood of dread rushed me, as all I could think of was that mysterious abandoned campsite, with the ripped tent, smashed cooler, and cooktop. We have been camping since, and have enjoyed the beauty of the Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped. And we all think our lucky star's guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. Like I said, this all happened years ago now. Guts is no longer with us. He's journeyed into the next phase and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him and how he saved us. He was a warrior, and his new brother, Geronimo, has that same spirit about him. Guts, I really hope you're resting easy, buddy. You deserve it. Just a little bit of context before I jump into the story. When I was 19, I lived with my mom in a ranch-style house on a road that backed up to a very large field. On the other side of our property was the main highway. About a half mile down from us was this loony farmer, and about a mile in the other direction of us was pretty much a crack house. I guess that at one point someone did used to live there, but it was run down and torn up, although I will say that the crackheads seemed to stay pretty quiet and to themselves. Other than those two houses, we were pretty much completely isolated. At the time, I was working a full-time job and going to school full-time as well. One of my classes ended at 10.30 p.m. I often wouldn't get home that day of the week until about 11.15ish. I was driving home one night, and I noticed some guy walking down the road. He had a yellow shirt and track pants on. I remember the outfit standing out to me because it just seemed so stupid. It wasn't weird to see people walking down my road because of the whole crack house thing, but as I instinctively looked over at him as I drove past, he turned his head, smiled, and waved, which absolutely freaked me the f out. So I speed the remaining half mile home, pull straight into the driveway, a bit weirded out. I made sure all the doors and windows were secure, and then I sat on the couch to be a paranoid freak and wait to make sure that the dude walked past my house. Except, he didn't. And by the time that he got to our property, there was another guy with him, dressed in darker clothes that I couldn't make fun of. They actually walked up my driveway and started playing around with my car, testing the handles and stuff, peering in through the windows. It's then that I realized in my hurry, I had forgotten to grab my phone from the car. So I was a touch worried that that's what they were after, until the guy in yellow started to approach our front door. I'm freaking out now, so I go and wake my mom up. She's bleary-eyed, and I'm trying to explain the whole situation when we both hear the doorknob turn very slowly. Good thing that it was deadbolted. My mom got out of bed, walked to the front door, and that's when yellow shirt guy knocked. I perched myself up on the couch so that I could get a good look at him and his friend, who was still in the driveway. Our porch light flicked on because it was on a sensor. Yeah, my mom said. A moment of straight silence passed before we hear, You dropped your wallet. I made it very clear to my mom that I had my wallet. It was in my purse. 
So she calmly says to him that she has her wallet, and that it was too late to be knocking on people's doors. I remember perfectly what he said next, even though this all took place about a decade ago now. Okay, I'm not a bad guy, just so you know. We were all pretty still. No one moved. Not even the guy at the door. Not even when the porch light went off. He just tried the handle again. My mom told me to call the cops and that she was going to get her gun. I told my mom that I didn't have my phone had accidentally left it in the car. That's when she walked to the kitchen to grab hers from the charger. She handed me the phone and quickly walked to the bathroom. From where I stood, I could see her stare out the window into the backyard. Then she went to her room to grab her Ruger. I was on the phone with the cops and explaining the situation, all while watching the two guys, explaining that there were two suspicious men at our door, when my mom came back out and said, there's one in our backyard too, which explained why she had looked out the bathroom window. She had caught a glimpse of the other man from the kitchen and went to go get a more discreet look. My mom walked back over to the door with her gun and loudly said, if he tries the handle again, I'm just going to open the door and shoot him. Who knows why she said that instead of waiting for the cops to arrive, but it worked like a charm. The guys took off down the road. I told her, and she rushed to the bathroom, where the guy in our backyard had apparently seen his friends running down the road and decided to sprint off too. They were headed in the direction of that crack house. The cops searched our property and our yard and went to the drug house where they found five dudes just hanging around. One was a yellow shirt guy, and I can only assume that his friends were with him. They got arrested, and nothing weird like that ever happened again. But I was on edge for a while. I still make sure that the doors are locked at all times every day I'm home, even though I live in a much nicer area now. I know that this story ended a bit anticlimactically, but living it out definitely left both my mom and I unsettled. I still remember the fear that I had in the moment, not knowing what those men wanted and why they were at our door. I've asked my mom about this semi-recently, and without batting an eyelash, she told me that she was scared too, but not the way that I would have thought. She wasn't scared for her safety or wondering why these guys were at our home. She was scared about what she'd have to do if they tried to get in. Although she made sure to tell me that she wouldn't have hesitated for an instant. At the time that this story took place, my best friend was doing her social media influencer thing. She wasn't big time, but she did have a big enough following to get free stuff and had been privileged enough to get two sponsored trips. She still worked a full-time job, but did the IG thing on the side, mostly for the perks, considering that she never made it big enough to live off of. Anyway, this was her first trip. A little boutique hotel from Miami had reached out to her via Instagram and had offered her an all-expenses-paid trip to Miami for Memorial Day weekend. In exchange, she just had to be in the hotel, take a few pictures, do a couple of Instagram stories. She was even told that she could bring a female friend with her if she wanted to, and that everything would be covered for. This was her first time doing this, so at the time, she wasn't really sure of how it worked. They sent her some oddball contract for her to sign, and it said that she'd be responsible for paying for her plane ticket to Miami, and that she'd be reimbursed for it later. This was in essence to prevent a no-show, meaning the influencer gets the ticket purchased by the hotel and influencer never shows up. It seemed reasonable. She invited me, her gay dude best friend, instead of a female friend because she was nervous about the whole thing. We figured it wouldn't be a big deal and worst case scenario, if they didn't want to pay for my plane ticket, she'd just cover it for me and that would be that. We were supposed to be picked up by the hotel at the airport. So our trip day comes, and when we arrive to Miami, there's a guy holding a sign 
that has both her last name and the hotel logo on it. We're greeted and quickly escorted to a black SUV. Now, here's where things start to get weird. Before we can even climb into the car, the driver, a separate guy, is visibly upset. We thought that he was talking to the guy who had walked us over, but he was speaking directly to my friend. He had a very thick accent and was wearing dark shades. He told my friend that she was not allowed to bring her boyfriend, me, and that she had said that it was two girls, two girls. Hotel told me two girls, no one girl, one guy, two girls. He was demanding to see where the other girl was. We were both speechless and a bit confused. The guy who walked us to the car looked annoyed. He got in the front passenger seat and started a fight with the driver in Portuguese. At least, I think it was Portuguese, because it for sure wasn't Spanish. Then the passenger turns to us and asks where the other girl is. My friend tells them, very upset by now, that there is no other girl, that she's the model that they contracted with, and I was just a friend coming with her on the trip. The big guy in the passenger seat gets out, tosses our luggage out of the car, and says something like, this is some f***ing bullshit. He gets back in the car, and they take off. That was it. We were in shock left by the side of the road, right outside of the airport. Utter and complete shock. My friend immediately emails Melissa, the person who was supposedly contacting her through Instagram, the main PR person of the hotel, to tell her what had happened. But predictably, no response. We decide to grab a cab and show up at the hotel. When we show up, everything begins to make sense. The hotel itself had been rebranded and had a completely different name, owner, and staff. We showed them the Instagram account that had reached out to my friend, and it was indeed the Instagram of the hotel that it used to be, but not the one it currently is. Turns out, they never contacted us. They never did anything. Whoever was in charge of the old Instagram account for the old hotel did, or more likely, Whoever got a hold of that account did. Mind you, this was a somewhat big hotel account with 10,000 plus followers. It was actually a real account. But upon further inspection, we realized that the pics were really old and so were the posts. Needless to say, my friend felt like an idiot and wouldn't stop shedding emotions about it. We called the police, met up with a detective, although nothing ever came out of it. They investigated who was running the account before and who had access to it, but none of the people who used to run that account had anything to do with this. It's both upsetting and terrifying to think that whoever was behind this was actively trying to shield their true intentions behind the facade of a free vacation. What's even more troubling is wondering if this wasn't their first time attempting such a thing. That Instagram account in question has since been deleted and we never heard anything more from anyone ever again. But to think that my friend would have been kidnapped or potentially worse had she gone with another girl instead of me sends chills down my spine to this very day. I don't remember exactly how old I was just that I was small enough to fit in the front baby seat of a grocery cart. That had put us in the late, very late 90s, maybe early 2000s. I was grocery shopping with my mom at a Costco. For those who don't know the chain, it's basically a huge warehouse where everything is sold in bulk. Food, clothes, books. It's basically a Walmart, but if Walmart sold cereal boxes in counts of threes, or frozen dinners by the dozen. My mom has a bit of a habit of pulling her grocery cart down to one side of the aisle in stores and then walking the length of the shelves, picking out what she wants, and then coming back to the cart and dumping what she has in the basket. I don't get why she does it, but hey, moms do weird things, right? So I'm three, maybe four, sitting in the front basket playing with my Game Boy Color, 
when she pulls over next to a fruit display in Costco. She tells me that she's going to go check out what's on sale, and for me to stay put. I wasn't a very fidgety kid, so there was no problem there. She's gone for a couple of minutes. I'm absorbed in Pokemon, so I don't really notice her walk up until the cart starts moving. Being a kid, I instinctively trust that she's the one pushing the cart, but I was wrong. After a moment or two, I catch out of the corner of my vision her red nails. This is something that stood out to me because my mom never painted her nails and never, ever wore them long, like the nails that were wrapped around the handlebar right now. I look up. The lady pushing the cart is a little older than my mother, same curly black hair but pulled into a ponytail at the nape of her neck. I still remember she had tanned, Italian-type skin with thick red lips, a heavy coat of eyeliner, and brown eyes. She was pretty skinny, her teeth were yellowed, and she smelled like what I didn't realize until later, bad B.O. This wasn't my mom, and I said so, very loudly. She laughed and looked around and pushed the cart just a little bit faster. I said it again, and she looked me dead in the eyes and said, I'm paraphrasing here because I don't remember the exact wording, Oh sweetie, what game are you playing? I am your mom. So the way Costco is set up, at least ours, is that in the produce area, instead of aisles, they're more like islands. They're large square setups that you can see the entire length of the produce section if you walk in that area. So of course... I can see my actual mother a few displays away. As loud as I could, I remember yelling, Mom! and watching her head whip around to look at me, right as this lady is trying to cover my mouth with her hand. I don't know if she decided that I wasn't worth it because I was so noisy, or if looking at my mother charging from a few displays over. Side note, my mom is not a petite woman. She's built like a linebacker, and played both softball and roller derby throughout college. She's more of an ox than a human woman, but that's what I appreciate about her. But anyway, this woman squeezed her hand around my little face once, and then booked it. My mom comes running up to me and starts asking me a million questions at once. My little brain thinks all of a sudden that I'm in trouble for using my outdoor voice inside, because she looks so mad I begin to cry. By the time she had calmed me down, that lady was already long gone, and reporting her to the head of security, did bupkis. Storm never found her inside, and security camera footage showed her leaving through the main entrance, but it didn't catch what car she got in, which way it exited the lot, or if she even got into a car at all. I don't know why she picked me, or what it would have been for. But I'm just glad my real mom ended up scaring her away and that nothing more came of it. So to the lady who tried to kidnap me from the Costco produce section, claiming to be my mother, I hope you found the deodorant on your way out, but I also hope that we never meet again. The story that I'm about to share took place about five years back, when I was still in my senior year of high school. At the time, my mother and I called Southern California home, and although that has since changed, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up every time I think about this particular evening. It was fairly late, maybe 8.30 or 9 p.m. We had just walked through the door after a long day of driving and visiting family. But before either one of us could settle in and get comfy at home, we realized that our cat had no food left in the house. We were both utterly exhausted from the day, so the idea of trekking off to Petco for Meow Mix was a bit of a nightmare in my book. While I really didn't want to go, my mother all but pleaded with me to make the trip with her, and after having my arm thoroughly twisted through parental guilt, I gave in. While I was stewing in my own wants to stay home and play Xbox, 
I had no idea then just how thankful I would be that I ultimately took the drive with my mom. A little more groundwork for the story. My mom drove a 2012 Honda Accord at the time. It was an economical, gas-saving car for my single mom, but she loved that thing. She had personalized floor mats, a nice sound system, and windows tinted so dark that it kind of felt like you were riding in a limo sometimes. I always loved the base of the subs in the back, but looking back, that tint might have been the sweetest addition to that car. We pulled into the Petco parking lot, where there were only a small handful of other cars spread around the lot. A few right in front of the store, a few more towards the very back of the lot. But only ours seemed to take up the ground in between. My mom knew I wasn't thrilled to be on this journey, so she suggested that I waited in the car while she ran in and quickly grabbed the cat food. I agreed because I didn't really want to go in anyway. She hops out of the car and hustles into the store. But as she does, one of the cars that was parked near the rear of the lot pulled up a few rows and parked in the spot one space over from ours on the passenger side. I remember thinking that that was a bit odd, but as the man in the driver's seat got out, he quickly retrieved his large German Shepherd from the back seat. At that point, I just thought that he was trying to get closer to the store so he wouldn't have to lug his big pooch the length of the lot. But there were so many other spots that he could have taken. Why the spot right next to us? The man and his dog head into the store as well, but only about as far in as the first set of displays. Dude seemed like he looked at the same end cap of dog treats and shoes for five or six minutes. He only moved away from that stand when he saw my mom coming down the nearest aisle. He jumped into the checkout line right in front of her. Once he was done paying, he stationed himself basically right outside the automatic doors of the store, but positioned slightly to the side so he could glance back in at my mom while she paid. Once she exited the store, that's when he turned and followed her towards the cars. My mom gets to the trunk, pops it, and begins to throw the two bags in her arms inside, when the dude next to us does the same. But as he pops open his trunk, I hear him speak to my mom. I can't hear exactly what he's saying from inside the car, but I hear him say something, and my mom then responds. As I look out the window, it looks like he's speaking to her while gesturing towards something in the back of his car. My mom is oblivious to the scene that I've been watching unfold, and she starts to take a few steps towards this weird guy. As she does, I swear I see him begin to lunge forward towards her. Before I can even think, I fling the door open and erupt in the most frantic parental voice that I've ever had to use on my own parent, screaming at her to get her back into the car. I don't know who I startled more, my mom, or the creep, because while my mom looked back at me with an annoyed look of bewilderment on her face, the creep practically jumped a foot off the ground. Once I popped out on them, the guy slammed his trunk and hastily said, never mind, before beelining for his driver's side door and pulling off without so much as looking at me. I can only assume that when dude pulled up next to us, he didn't see me in the passenger seat due to the dark tints. So when I began to yell, it caught him way off guard that there was someone else in the mix. Once my mom got in the car, I asked her what he was saying to her and why she would walk towards this guy. She said that the stranger had made some comment about something he had just gotten for his dog and invited her over to take a look at it. At that point, I told her everything that I saw, how he pulled up next to us the moment that she went inside how it seemed like he was watching her, and even how he lingered while waiting for her to pay. I am convinced that whoever that guy was, he was going to attempt to abduct my mother that evening. Telling the story still causes me to feel my heart in my throat, because I truly feel that had I not been there that night, I may never have seen my mom again.
This happened when I was around 17 years old and is still happening today. At 17, I felt lost in the world and stuck in a job that I disliked with work colleagues that disliked me. I think that this had to do with my accent as I was quite well spoken so they had this idea that I was some rich snobby kid. It all started on a Friday after work. The factory I worked in had a half day on Fridays, so I would just spend the rest of the day wandering around the city that I lived in. It had been a tough day of relentless mocking, and I was reaching my breaking point. I went around the city looking for a new job. I visited the police recruitment center, the army, navy, and air force centers, and even the International Red Cross. I just wanted to get away from it all. After a few hours, I had a bag full of career pamphlets and still no idea what to do with my life. I turned a corner and immediately saw a sign sitting right in front of me. I can remember it so vividly now. It said, free personality test. Are you curious about yourself? Come in. I then looked up at the building and on a big, fancy sign outside, it said, the Church of Scientology. Now, before I continue, yes, I already knew about Scientology, but I had a morbid curiosity about it. I had heard all the horror stories and goings on inside the church, but Tom Cruise was my favorite actor and he seemed to have his life sorted out pretty well. I feel now that those were some famous last thoughts right there. So I went inside. I was immediately greeted by a very nice lady. She asked me how I was doing and what she could do for me today. I asked if I could speak to somebody about the church and the personality test. She smiled and said, I would be happy to. Please take a seat and I'll get you someone to speak to. After a moment, I was introduced to an older man named Alan and he was the head of my city's Scientology Center. Alan took me to a small room to speak privately. When we entered, I immediately noticed a large picture of L. Ron Hubbard on the wall. We sat down and had a friendly chat. I told him about how I was unhappy about where my life was going. I told him about how I wanted to leave, plus all the trouble that I was having at work. He seemed genuinely concerned for me, and I felt as if he wanted to help. After a while of talking, I agreed to do the personality test. He gave me the test and left the room saying to give the test to the receptionist after I had finished. Two hours later, I was done. Not joking, that's really how long it took. It was about 500 questions about anything and everything. I handed it in to the receptionist and she told me it would take some time to process. In the meantime, Alan had told her to take me to their private cinema and show me a film. I thought it was just going to be some old room in the back with a TV on the wall, but no. They did indeed have a private cinema. It could seat around 50 people and had a large screen in the front. It did feel a bit weird just being there by myself, in a cinema owned by Scientology. But I bet that hasn't happened to many people. Or maybe it has. Anyway, I sat down and they played me the film. It was about 30 minutes long and consisted of a narrator explaining those strange feelings you sometimes get, with some mediocre acting following along. I remember a section about how much you doubt yourself, knowing you have a locked door but going back to check multiple times. At one point, the film showed how a past event that happened to your mother while she was pregnant with you could affect your life in a negative way. Example, your mother was sick on a flight, so now you're scared of flying. I also vaguely remember something about rotten eggs and how much an event involving them can hurt you. I know it sounds absurd, but in some ways, the film really made sense to me. When the movie was done, I was taken to Alan's office and he told me my results. He told me that I was extremely depressed, one of the most unmotivated people he had ever met, 
lacking cognitive thinking, and I was a waste of talent. Now, this made me very upset, but Alan said that he could help me. He gave me about four books and a DVD. He told me to read the books and watch the film before my course. I asked, what course? And Alan told me he had signed me up to do a course at the center. He convinced me that if I didn't do this course, that my life would soon spiral out of control. In addition to that, he made me hand over quite a bit of money for the course and said I would receive an email about the course, which was in a month's time. I left the center, ran home, and immediately started reading the books that I was given. This happened all over the weekend. I had basically locked myself in my room and did nothing but read and reread those books and watch the DVD over and over again. Over the next week, I began taking notes about myself and my family. I emailed Alan with questions and concerns. I started resenting my mother for my life. I began to think that she was the problem, that everything bad that happened to me was the result of her. And I started treating her badly, swearing at her, and did the best that I could to ignore her. When I emailed Alan about my mother, he told me that if she was the catalyst for my problems, then maybe I should consider disconnecting from her. And I took that bullshit seriously. I made plans to totally leave her out of my life. A week before my course, I developed some kind of God complex towards everyone around me. What I read in those books told me what I could become. I saw everyone in my family as below me. I really became a truly spiteful person. Just days before my course, I was confronted by both my mother and father. They said they were concerned about me and that they had searched my room. My dad took out all of my Scientology books and the DVD. I was outraged. I screamed and swore at them. I said horrible things to them. I told them about how I was going to leave them and how I never wanted to see them again. Hours of arguing back and forth, tears and swears. However, in the end, they did convince me that the church was a bad place. They said, if I was so miserable at work, I should have told them. And that, that's true. To this day, I can't believe I didn't say anything to them. Instead, I went to the Church of Scientology. That night, after the arguing had stopped, they sat me down and did their best to comfort me. I really couldn't believe it. After the way I had treated them for the past month, they still cared about me. The next day, I emailed Alan and told him I wouldn't be coming back to the church. He quickly got back to me asking why, asking if it was my family and if I was being forced to not go. I didn't respond. I ignored him. The emails I received in the next few weeks were mad. Alan told me stuff like, I should leave my family now, and that I could stay at the church. He tried to convince me that it was all because of my mother. He even emailed me to say something along the lines of, he wouldn't be surprised if he read in the papers that I had ended it all by my own hand. I'm very sure that he crossed a line there, but I just kept ignoring him. The strangest email that I got was one in all binary code. 00110-1011 this and 10010101110 that. I used a binary code translator, but it all came back as mixed up letters and numbers. None of it made sense. After weeks of this, I eventually blocked Alan. However, it still hasn't stopped. About two or three times a year, I'll get an email from the church. It's either asking how I am or asking about my family. When I get them, I immediately block the email address, but they just keep coming. It's always someone new saying they heard about my case and they were worried about me. The whole reason I'm sharing this is because I just got another email the other day. 
and I thought that it would make a good warning. Please, I beg of you, do not go to a Church of Scientology center. If they can turn me into a spiteful degenerate in just a few hours, then what can they do with a person in a few months or a year? If anyone has an idea of how to block an entire religion slash cult from my email, please let me know. And if you're lost in life, sad, or upset, then please talk to your family, friends, or a doctor. When you're down, don't let others make you into a monster. Take it from me. After this event, I got help, and I find that I'm a much more happy and confident person now. I thank you for listening, and Alan, if you're on the other end of this, you made me into a monster. So for your sake, I hope we don't meet again. For a little context, this happened back in 2001, pretty much right after 9-11. I'm a female, and I was 24 years old at the time, driving by myself across country to get to my son who was with my ex. I had been out of state, taking care of a sick family member. So I'm on the drive, middle of the night, going through New Mexico. I can't remember the route, but I was on a two-lane highway. And while I can remember seeing cars going the opposite way in fairly short intervals, this was not a densely populated highway by any means. But after a relatively quiet, several hour stretch of driving down this worn road, I glance up in my rear view and see the unmistakable glow of blue and red lights coming up on me. When you see cop lights in your mirror, all sorts of emotions present themselves. For me that night, a feeling of annoyance because I know that I wasn't speeding or anything of that sort. An exhaustion, as I think I was about nine hours into my trip and I was maybe five miles away from the exit for the hotel that I had planned on stopping at for the night. But I know the expectation, so I pulled over towards the shoulder as the lights get closer and closer to my brake lights. As the cop car pulls off as well, they flip the flashing lights off. And before I know it, there's a cop at my driver's side window, standing there in anticipation, waiting for me to roll it down. Now this, off the bat, seemed a little off. When I'd been pulled over in the past on a stretch of road that has traffic flying down it, the cops would usually come up on the passenger side. And although it was late, there were still vehicles driving well over 60 miles per hour down this particular road. He asked for driver's license and registration, which I hand over without incident. Yet, he stood at my window and stared at me for a good 15 seconds before walking back to his car. He returned almost immediately, and that's when he asked me to step outside of the car. That was about the point where I started to get worried. I've gotten tickets before, but being asked to step out of the car was far from the norm for me. I did it though, at which point he asked me if I'd been drinking. I replied that I had not been drinking, and quickly asked why I was being stopped in the first place. He said that I was driving erratically, which I knew for a fact was not true. He then flat out asked me if I was a terrorist. I was taken aback by the sheer absurdity of the question, because while I know that terrorists can come in all shapes and sizes, I was young, blonde, blue-eyed, and a veteran with completely valid ID. There was no reason to even ask such a thing. He gave me the walk the line drunk driving test, which I passed. He then said that he needed to search my car to see if I had any drugs on me. I thought about this for a minute because I'm aware of my rights and all, but it was so late. I was tired and alone. I just didn't want to deal with the BS of refusing. So I gave him the okay because I knew I didn't have anything in the car. When he got to my trunk, he opened up a small suitcase that happened to have my work clothes in it. Side note, I was an exotic dancer at the time, so you can imagine what I mean when I say work clothes. He asked me about the clothing, 
I told him that I was a stripper. This admission seemed to really set him off. He began screaming at me about being a trash person. And this absolutely pissed me off and caused me to re-examine the situation with a little bit more depth. Again, tired and alone with this weird guy who appears to be a cop. Every once in a while, a car would drive by, but for the most part, the roads were empty. Middle of the night, and I didn't have anything to protect myself versus this guy that had a gun. He told me then that I needed to walk back towards the tree line that was near the road. I stared him dead in the face and said, no. I demanded that he call for backup, more officers, his supervisor to come. This was something that he was visibly thrown off by. I said that I wanted a female officer and I would no longer be complying with anything that he said. And then I began trying to flag down the few cars passing by at that moment. He told me to calm down. And at this point, he wrote out a speeding ticket and let me go. I opted not to move my vehicle before he took off. I didn't want him seeing where I was going. But it was when he pulled off into the night that I got another bit of a shock. The car that he was in, while it looked like a cop car, it had zero identifying marks of one. No state or county insignia. No lights on the top of the car. And that's when a feeling of dread swept over my entire being. I pretty much floored it to the hotel, and once I was checked in, that's when all the emotions came pouring out. I never paid that speeding ticket, and never heard a word about it either. This happened more than 20 years ago, and at the time, I was really shaken up about it. So much so that I pushed it far down and did my best to forget all about it. But looking back now, I don't believe that was a real cop that stopped me on that lonely highway that night. I think that the only thing that kept me from something bad happening was the pushing back against what he was asking me to do. The moment that I was no longer an easy target, he gave up. Something that I thank myself for every time this memory comes out. I'm glad to say that listening to my gut likely kept me out of something much, much worse. So I implore others to do the same. Listen to your gut. If something feels off, it's because it is. This is a pretty convoluted story, even by my own admission. So bear with me as I try to convey everything I can recall about what led me to the conclusion that my ex-housemate could have potentially been a serial killer or a serial killer in the making. It was the summer of 2015 when I moved in, and at first appearances, my housemate slash landlord Mike was somewhat normal, if not a bit socially awkward and dysfunctional. When I was signing the papers, he was adamant that I should never go into the basement, which I found odd, but I really needed a place to stay, and, well, people have their little quirks, so I just chalked it up to that at the time. As I got to know Mike, and our cohabitation continued, I learned more about the depths of his dysfunction. Firstly, that he used meth. Now, I don't automatically judge people based on their vices, but I was surprised at the extent of his use. He was probably the first person that I ever knew who used meth and balanced a full-time job, enjoying a decent amount of success in life. The reason this is important to the story is that when he would be around the house, drinking and using his drugs, he would start to run off at the mouth. He would often joke that if I smelled lye coming from the basement, not to think anything of it. I think it was maybe the third time that he said this that I finally asked why he kept saying that. That's when he said, I use chemicals to clean up after the bodies, with a wily grin on his face. I tried to chalk that one up to a bad sense of humor, but it didn't sit right with me. He was also very particular that I let him know of my comings and goings of the day, 
in addition to my work schedule. I remember him being shocked and uncomfortable one day that I ended up taking off of work because he didn't realize that I was home. I remember that day because there was a lot of clanging and what sounded like muffled shouting coming from the basement. His car was in the driveway, but he was not in the main house or his bedroom. Other days, he would play very loud music that bumped through the whole house. Sometimes, he would even play NPR talk radio at those same volumes. In retrospect, I think he may have been trying to mask sounds. He would make remarks about sex workers, saying, you can do whatever you want. You can choke them or beat them to death, and nobody will care. I took exception to this. I told him that I thought that was messed up. But when he would get tweaking, he'd always come back around to alluding to the same kind of violence, talking about how he was a normal white guy who owned a house, and he had a good career, so the police would never suspect him of anything. At this point, I start to think that it has gone too far to simply be a joke. I was in a weird position because money was tight at the time, and my options were few. I try to convince myself that even if he is messed up, he's probably just engaging in outward fantasism. I knew that he would acquire the services of sex workers on occasion, but again, did not judge that activity at face value, although it started to become a concern. At one point, I was doing laundry one night. I caught whiffs of what I can only think of as decomposition. The house we were in was in southeast Portland. It was a relatively new property, and having grown up in upstate New York, I know that animals can become trapped in the walls and die. But this was the garage, and there were no animals scurrying in the walls. This was strange, and telling to me. I considered carefully what I would do, and I decided I would confront him about the smell. I decided to pose the question in a somewhat suggestive manner, by expanding on his jokes. I told him that he needs to do a better job cleaning up the bodies, because I could smell the rot emanating from the garage. I will never forget his reaction. His eyes widened, and he shot me a sharp glare, somewhere between fear and rage. He stumbled over his words and eventually responded, What? Really? I said, Yes, really. And there were a few seconds of awkwardness before he said, Thanks for letting me know, and promptly went into his bedroom and shut the door. A few days after that, he went into the upper crawl space in the garage while I was again doing laundry. He called for me and was trying to convince me to come up into the crawl space with him. My body locked up, and it was like my instincts were screaming at me that if I went up there, I wouldn't come back down. I gave some excuse that I can sparsely remember that I had to be someplace. I packed up my laundry, threw it in my room, and promptly left. He spent a lot of time in the padlock basement without a doorknob. The only way in was through the backyard. Looking back on this, I wish I would have gone down there to either confirm or dismiss the suspicions once and for all. In the last couple of months that I lived there, I was privy to more graphic comments about women and sex workers, explicit talk of sexual violence, and he was using more and more. He once showed me a video that he made. He's a graphic designer and artist as well, which featured heavy bondage themes, interspersed with distorted audio of women screaming, along with this strange, leering figure in a plague doctor costume. It was one of those situations where any one of these things alone may have been innocuous, but as they accumulated, it became suspicious to me. It was October of 2016 when I finally left there taking off to the Ocheti Oyate camp during the anti-pipeline protests with Standing Rock Lakota. It was a feeling of being called to action and having nothing else to lose, as I wanted to get out of that house in the worst kind of way. My last night there, I didn't give notice that I was leaving. He was drinking and tweaking once more. He 
started in on the same conversation, loosely describing murder and violence towards women in the tone of some sort of edgy joke. I told him that he would be caught eventually, not even holding back my suspicion anymore. He reiterated that he was the last person police would suspect, and asserted that nobody would be catching him. He said this in a very serious and concise way, dropping the pretense that he had been using before. I left the next morning. Now this haunted me for months, then a year, then a year and a half. I felt as though I hadn't done anything. The guilt was just eating away at me. So that's when I called Portland Crime Stoppers and put in an anonymous tip describing the situation that I had left. When I did, the operator started going back and forth, putting me on hold, because the call had piqued the interest of the police sergeant, who was assigned to the call center. So they began asking me detailed questions about his vehicle, the house, the methods that he described, things like that. It really seemed like they took an interest. I gave them as much information as I could remember, and left it at that, feeling just a little bit better that I had at least tried to do something about it. Fast forward to recent times, and I told my mother about all of this, and she too became interested, asking what house this was, what was the address, and then she ended up pulling it up on Google Maps. She brought up the street view, and I noticed there was a large enclosed trailer in the driveway that wasn't there when I was. I could theorize why it might have been there, but can't put together a practical reason for it, or why he'd be using it, unless he was moving, or using it to haul things to discard. Admittedly, that is all pure conjecture, but I couldn't help but wonder. I doubt that I will get closure, or have my suspicions validated, unless he does finally get caught and arrested, and I happen to read about it. I've grown up poor, and been around low lives a lot in my life. I've interacted with many sketchy and unsavory people in my time, but none of them have ever made the impression that Mike made on me. Make of it what you will, but I hope I never meet him again. This happened a few nights back, so I still find myself replaying it over and over in my head. I thought that this would be a good place to share. I'm a pretty predictable person, with a predictable routine schedule, so I'm not sure if this was a random occurrence, or if someone knew my nightly routine. I'm a 35-year-old woman, my husband Rob gets up for work hours before me, so he often goes to bed before I do. I usually get to bed a few hours after he does, around the same time every night. I turn off the lights and TV in the living room, and take my dog to the back door to let her out. She's tiny, old, and poses zero threat to anyone. The door itself leads to a large deck outside. Off to the right of the deck are a few steps down and a small path to the gate, which we always keep chained and locked. Every single night before opening the door, I've developed a habit. I peek out the window right next to it without disturbing the blinds and flip on the deck light. Not sure where this came from, but it's nearly an OCD level tick now. I never expect anyone to be there, and we've never had a problem with anyone trespassing or trying to break in. It's just something that I do every night. Kind of like peeking behind the shower curtain before you pee. We all know no one is back there, but if you don't check, then that's going to be the one time that there actually is someone hiding there, you know? So a few nights ago, it's about that time of night, I got ready for bed, went to the back door with my dog slowly following behind me, peeked out the window, and flipped on the light. Only this night, my heart jumped into my throat when I saw a skinny, dirty guy in his 30s standing off to the side of the door, looking directly at it. I see him raise his arm up and hold what looks to be a screwdriver above his head as soon as the light flicks on, as if he were preparing for someone to open the door. 
Some people say they freeze for a moment when faced with some sort of crisis, but not me. I immediately screamed, Rob, get up, get the gun, as loud as I could, which seemed to startle the guy outside. He jumped over the rail of the deck and hit the ground with a thud, even though he was right next to the stairs. I heard impact on the gate down the stairs as well, which gave me every indication that whoever this guy was, he was now running off into the night. My husband ran out of our bedroom with his gun, which I give him full credit for doing after being awakened from a dead slumber by his screaming wife. He called the police, and they showed up within five minutes. They ended up driving around the neighborhood, trying to find the guy, but no luck. When they took my statement, I gave them every detail that I could recall in the two seconds of seeing the guy, but it wasn't much. While I very much got the feeling that these cops wanted to help, the realization that they likely weren't going to be able to find this creep is most likely what swept over them. Turns out, the guy broke the lock on our gate to get in. He had also pried open the back screen door, which we always kept locked as well. If I would have opened the door without looking out first, I might have let him right in, or I may have walked into an attack meant for me. I don't know if I caught the guy trying to break in, or if he was waiting for me to open the door like I do every night. Either way, it was f***ing terrifying. My parents are buying us outdoor security cameras this week as an early birthday present for Rob and as a deterrent for any other neighborhood creeps that might get the same idea the first creep did. Glad we never did come face to face, but that was still a close enough call for a couple of lifetimes in my book. I came over to the United States from Serbia at the age of 13 with my mother. My older brother, who's 15 years older than me, had lived in America for a few years and he had finally sent for us. We had long hoped to be reunited as a family, so we were particularly excited to make the journey. We arrived in New York City and the plan was for my brother to come get us from the airport. However, his wife was nine months pregnant at the time and my niece decided that she couldn't wait for us before she made her own arrival into the world. My brother couldn't leave his wife, so he asked a co-worker of his, a fellow cab driver, to pick us up in the city and drive us to New Jersey where he and my sister-in-law lived. When we got to New York City, we waited in customs for what seemed like forever. We looked out for my brother, but didn't see him. This was the early 90s, and cell phones weren't as common. And even if they were, my mom and I didn't have one. We panicked a bit, not seeing my brother or my sister-in-law, when suddenly we heard our names being called and saw a tall man. He introduced himself in perfect Serbian and explained that he was a good friend of my brother's and then told us about the baby. He said he'd be driving us the two hours from the airport to my brother's home. My mom relaxed a bit and they happily began to converse about the baby and my brother and America. I, however, just felt a bit off. This guy gave me bad vibes, and regardless of my brother's friendship with him, I instantly felt a feeling of distrust. We drove for a good hour and a half when he announced that he was going to take us for breakfast. We hadn't eaten in over 15 hours, so we were starving. We pulled up to a house, which was something that both my mom and I were confused by. He insisted cheerfully that his wife was cooking us breakfast, and after we'd eaten, he'd drive us the rest of the way to the hospital to see my family. My mom shushed me when I whispered something didn't feel right, and told me that we needed to be grateful for the hospitality. We were led into the house. It was dark, dank, and dirty. And as we're being shown around this ragtag dwelling, I think my mom finally got a bit nervous herself and began insisting that the man take us to my brother. That's when the guy grabbed my mom by the wrist, telling her that he needed a wife to take care of him and his house. Apparently, when he heard my brother tell the others at work that she'd be coming to stay, this man said that he knew that he'd found a wife. At that time, I was a scrawny little scamp of a kid, 
and even though I tried pushing him off my mom, he hit me so hard that I saw stars. At this point, we were terrified. Neither of us spoke English. The only phone number we knew was my brother's home number, and he was at the hospital. Also, in Serbia, you don't dial 911, so even if I could, I didn't know that's how to call the police here. This man tells my mom she's to clean and cook for him, and he takes me to the basement, where I was locked in what I now know is called the laundry room. I banged and cried and yelled, but it was so far down in the basement that everything was muffled, and I'm sure no one outside could hear me. For a week, we were kept in his home. He'd lock us up in the basement after my mom cooked him breakfast, and he'd let us out when he'd come home at four. If we had to use the restroom, there was a bathroom in the basement, but that's it. Just a bathroom and laundry room. It was freezing cold down there too. And even with us huddling together under a blanket, it did nothing. On our eighth morning down there, I discovered a small window by climbing on some boxes. I managed to force it open, and my mother insisted that I squeeze through it. I didn't want to leave her, and I couldn't figure out how I'd be able to get us help. I couldn't speak the language, nor could I read it. However, I knew that I didn't want to live this way the rest of my life, so I did as she asked. I ran once I got out, and I bet that I was quite the sight. A scrawny boy with no shoes, only wearing shorts and a t-shirt in the middle of November. But I'm sure that that's at least partially what saved us. Several concerned neighbors tried to get me to come to them, although I wouldn't. I was terrified. I just kept trying to get them to follow me. The police were eventually called, and a very nice policeman tried to get me into his car. But that's when I saw the man who'd taken us drive up in his taxi. He saw me with the cops, and promptly took off. That's when I made a run for the house. I knew I had to get back to my mom. Needless to say, the cop and his partner ran after me, and after making entry into that awful home, my mother was rescued. It took another four hours for them to find someone who spoke our language, for us to tell them what had happened. A warrant was issued for the man, my brother was contacted. Turns out that his friend had told them we never showed, and my brother had been frantically calling everyone back home in Serbia trying to find us. My brother drove up to get us and to give the cops information on his supposed friend so that they could find him, but they never did. From what I understand as an immigrant, it was much easier to simply fall off the map as a foreigner pre-9-11. This act made me distrustful of people and their intentions for a long time afterwards. My mom grew homesick and she ended up going back to Serbia. I stayed here with my brother and finished school, then later attended the police academy. I don't know if I would have chosen that path had I not met the nice officer that helped us all those years ago. I think of that guy who kept us prisoner every now and then, and honestly, I wouldn't mind meeting him now. I just don't think he'd want to meet me. This story took place in 2010. My child was four years old, and I'm 100% sure that my kid prevented something terrible from happening to me that day. Sort of a funny yet not funny twist to all of this is that this story was adapted into a Law & Order episode with a terrifying ending. By way of background, I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin which has the honor of being one of the most racially segregated cities in the country. It's a cool city overall, but we have a really shitty inner city with a ton of poverty and violence and gang activity. At the time that this happened, I was living in sort of an in-between area. Not the hood, but far from a super nice area either. I was a 22-year-old single mom. I lived in a ground floor apartment on one of the main streets of the city. When I'd arrive home from work, I'd park in the back alley behind my building. My front door faced the street, and I had a side door too. 
with a walkway running between my building and the one next door. Anyway, one day I got home in the middle of the afternoon on a Saturday with my kid. As we drove down the alley to get to my parking spot, I saw a guy in a hoodie sort of lurking around the area where I parked my car. It was weird because it was warm outside, yet he had his hood up. But there were a bunch of ne'er-do-well kids in the neighborhood, so whatever. It was definitely an odd place to just be standing, though. As I got close to the building and started pulling into my parking spot, he turned around and started walking towards the street, past my side door. He definitely left because I arrived. I figured that maybe he was just smoking a blunt or something. I didn't think anything further of it. I got my son and some bags out of the car, went the same way the guy had just taken to get to my side door. I didn't see him at all. My son and I went inside, and I was in the process of putting stuff down when my doorbell rang. I wasn't expecting anyone, but my mind immediately thought that it was this guy. Being young and naive, I answered the front door. It was indeed the same guy still with his hood up. He smiled at me, but not in a super friendly way, more of a leer. He looked to be about 16, cornrows, fake gold grill that was studded with little fake diamonds. I regretted opening the door, but here I was, so I just went with it. Hi. He kept staring at me, yet said nothing. At this point, I saw another kid in a hoodie pacing behind him on the sidewalk and looking at us. I was quickly realizing that this was not a good situation. My son, who I had momentarily forgotten about, came up behind me. He did the shy kid thing where he stood behind me and poked his head out from behind my butt to look at the guy. Hoodie Dude looked at him for a good couple of seconds, and then trained his attention back at me. Yo, is Danielle around? I don't know who that is. Maybe try the other door. I gestured to my neighbor's door to my left. Oh, you sure? Yeah, sorry, and go to close my door. As I do, he leaves, walking in the opposite direction of my neighbor's door. Hoodie dude number two happened to follow him. I thought it was really weird that they didn't even try to check next door for Danielle. I thought the whole thing was really weird. My boyfriend got to my apartment a few minutes later, and I was glad to see him. He had this really old Jeep that he always parked out front on the main street. When he went out to go get something from his car shortly after he arrived, the car was gone. Now, car theft was a pretty common thing in this neighborhood, but stealing it from the main street in broad daylight, well, that was pretty ballsy. So we called the cops, filed a report, the whole nine. I told the cop about hoodie dudes since it seemed like it could be important. I was able to give a good description of the guy who came to my door asking for Danielle. I had no idea if it was relevant, but the fact that the jeep was stolen shortly after these guys were around made it seem pretty relevant. That's where the story pauses for a couple of days. I got a call from a different cop with the downtown precinct. He told me that they had found the jeep and, other than the ignition, the car was in perfect working order. He asked if I could come downtown to do a lineup, see if I could identify the people who had knocked on my door right before the Jeep got taken. That was weird. A lineup for a stolen car? But I agreed. He asked if I could come down in a couple of days. Also weird. Why wouldn't they want me to do it right away? But I was mostly focused on the fact that doing a lineup was pretty f cool. So I go to the downtown precinct a couple of days later. The way this went seemed sort of unorthodox, but it was what it was. Two detectives took me into a dark room where a woman in her 50s was sitting with a young woman in a wheelchair. The young woman's lower leg was in a giant cast with this whole metal contraption surrounding it, with maybe a dozen metal rods going into the cast itself. At this point, I had no idea what was happening. The detectives instructed us that we weren't to say anything during the lineup, except if we wanted the guys to turn to their left or right 
or something like that. But we most definitely couldn't talk to each other at all. Okay, we ended up having to wait in the room for almost an hour, in the dark, awkwardly not speaking. They explained it was taking more time than anticipated to get 12 guys from the jail over to the precinct. Finally, we got started. They did two lineups and gave us forms to mark one, two, three, four, five, or six. There was a large window in front of us, and they explained that the guys wouldn't be able to see us. They turned the lights on in the room behind that window and brought each guy in individually. I couldn't identify anyone in the first lineup. I sort of felt bad actually, but I couldn't. The second lineup started and I didn't recognize guys one, two, or three. Number four came out though, and I immediately recognized the dude who had knocked on my front door. He didn't have his stupid grill in anymore, but it was definitely the guy. After the second lineup was done, they brought the other two women into the hallway and told me to stay put. After a few minutes, they came back to get me. The detectives asked if I recognized anyone, and I told them that I was sure about number four in the second lineup, although I couldn't identify anyone in the first. I had gathered by this point that hoodie dude number two had likely been in the first lineup, but I hadn't gotten a good look at him when he was pacing on the sidewalk. They had me sign two forms, one for each lineup, with the second form identifying number four as hoodie dude number one. When I gave the forms back, the detective told me that he could tell me what was actually going on now that the lineup was done. Good, because I was officially confused as fuck by this point. He explained that number four was indeed one of the guys they arrested with my boyfriend's Jeep. The guys had stolen the Jeep and driven to a nearby part of town, into a quiet and lily-white neighborhood. For what it's worth, I'm also white, and this is relevant. They came across a young couple unloading groceries from their car. The young woman with the leg contraption was the female half of that couple. They parked the stolen jeep behind the couple, got out, and immediately shot them both. They shot the woman in the leg, and they shot the young man in, well, the man parts. He was still in the hospital in bad condition, which is why he wasn't there. The older woman was the girl's mom and had brought her from the hospital just to do the lineup. The reason that it was delayed a couple of days was because the girl had to have emergency surgery to try and fix the damage to her leg. The guys didn't demand anything from the couple or take anything from them after the shooting. They just immediately shot them. The young woman managed to remember the license plate number of the Jeep and the suspects were apprehended in a corner store when a cop saw the stolen car parked outside shortly after the shooting. Both shooters were teenagers, yet both were being charged as adults. One of them had stupidly talked a bit before lawyering up, and had told a detective that this was a gang initiation. They had to shoot a white person. That was the price of admission. They had stolen my boyfriend's car after taking the bus out to the street that I lived on. They had figured that it would be easier to get away if they had wheels. The detectives were pretty sure that I had been the original target of opportunity, but couldn't explain why they hadn't gone through with it. I knew why. It was because he saw my kid peeking out from behind me. They told me I might have to testify if the case went to court, and told me that I'd hear from the DA's office when they needed me. A couple of months later, one of the detectives called me and told me that the hoodie dudes pled out to attempted murder charges in exchange for reduced time. I never asked how many years, but I assume that they're probably still in prison 13 years later. And for those who wonder, the guy who got shot in the nether region survived. As an ironic postscript to this story, my boyfriend had the same Jeep stolen from the same spot in front of my apartment about four months later, also in broad daylight. That time, the authorities didn't find it right away. He was staying over at my house weeks later when he got a call around 2 a.m. from the arson unit. Whoever had taken it had torched it 
and left it in the middle of the street in a notoriously violent area of the city. I moved shortly after that. It was Christmas time a year or two back when this story unfolded. My wife and I were staying at her childhood home where her mother now lived all alone. Well, not if you include all the cats. The house was on a quiet cul-de-sac in the suburbs. If you're picturing freshly mowed lawns, American flags, and empty sidewalks, you're picturing it right. It's a single story home with an attached garage out front. The garage has two doorways, apart from the electric garage door, of course. One leads to the garden and backyard. This door has an old doggy door from their days with dear old Max. Side note, RIP Max. They had covered that doggy door with a piece of nailed in wood. That had always made me slightly uncomfortable before, but I figure it had been that way for years, so what's the worst that could happen? The second door from the garage leads to the kitchen. Hollow core door. It could stop a mouse, but not much else. Definitely not something that wanted in, or someone. We were sound asleep in my wife's childhood bedroom at the front of the house. 3 a.m. I was in that deep, dark recess of sleep. You know, you're in the diving bell, and you're submerged hundreds of meters below the surface in black water, protected from the real world by miles of nothingness. But that's when I heard it. The scream. What are you doing? It was my mother-in-law's voice echoing down the hallway. To me, lost in a sea of sleep, it sounded like a jet engine roaring right past my eardrum. I bolted up. What happened next happened in a matter of seconds. But about that scream, even though I was dead asleep, I heard enough of it to sense an urgency behind it. This wasn't an, oh, you scared me type of scream. This was different, and I knew it. Not consciously, but my lizard brain, that piece we retained from our primitive ancestors, knew that something was wrong. I watch and read a fair amount of true crime, and this scream awakened that horrible fear within me. The one that says, this can't really be happening to me, can it? Honestly, in that second of the night, it sounded like someone was about to be murdered. You ever wonder if you're a fight or flight type of individual? I always have, and I came to know something about myself after this night. I'm a fighter. I leaped out of bed, growled, yes, growled, in the manliest voice I could muster. I'm gonna kill you, mother and took off running. I tore open the bedroom door and ran into the hallway. There, at the end, I saw my mother-in-law, nightgown on, look of utter shock on her face, standing as still as a mannequin. We make eye contact as I continue towards her. Then she turns her head, looks directly into the kitchen. I hurry past her and round the corner into the kitchen. The hollow core door is absolutely obliterated, shards everywhere. I look through the open frame and see that the electric garage door is open. I push ahead. As I run into the garage, I hear it. The sound of someone hopping into a running car just out of view. And just as I make it out onto the driveway, I can see a car peeling out from the sidewalk adjacent to the house. But my adrenaline is still pumping. And who am I to say no to adrenaline? So, like an idiot, I run, barefoot, after the car. I give it a good go, but I'm no Usain Bolt, and even he couldn't catch a speeding car. It soon vanishes down the street, and I'm left all alone. The police showed up within a few minutes, which, I have to say, makes me feel a lot more at ease with my mother-in-law living there. They took our statements. My mother-in-law said she heard a noise, the hollow core door being kicked in, and walked into the kitchen or she encountered the burglar, a small framed woman. The police theorized she was working as a part of a team. 
Her job was to squeeze through the doggy door, kick in the hollow core, and open the electric garage door for her accomplices. I'd say that this was backed up by the fact that when my mother-in-law came face to face with this woman burglar, she could easily see the large, dark silhouettes of two people behind this woman, still waiting to push in from the garage. According to the police, the burglar team most likely thought that nobody was home. Fortunately, my mother-in-law must have caught them off guard and scared them, in addition to my manly growl, of course. But it feels good to know that everyone was safe, and to learn that I guess I've got a little fight in me. And for the record, we bought the heaviest damn wooden door you've ever seen to replace that hollow core. I'd like to see a mouse try and get through that. My goal in sharing this story is twofold. One, to remind everyone to stay safe out there. And two, don't forget to practice your growls. There's no telling when they may come in handy. TV shows and movies usually depict abductors driving white or black vans. This is something that I didn't realize until I decided to buy a white 1994 Dodge Ram cargo van to haul some of the gear I needed for work. While driving it, I've been pulled over by cops and searched three different times for no reason. But that is for another story. The point is, some people see vans as very suspicious. One day, while returning home, a woman pushing a stroller stared at me for a long time while I drove along my home street. We have speed bumps, and I had a lot of expensive, delicate gear in the van, so I was purposely driving very slow. She stared at me, wide-eyed, the entire time. So I smiled at her, like a friendly neighbor would. She was staring so intently, she almost walked the stroller right off the edge of the curb. I thought it was funny, but just as quick as I got a laugh, I had almost forgotten about it. A week later, our HOA email thread heats up when a resident sends out a notice that his wife and toddler were being stalked by a man in a white van. Fearing a pitchfork and torch mob mistaking me for the creeper, I replied to all, saying that I live in the neighborhood and also drive a white van. I even provided my license plate number and home address. Big mistake. Jokingly, I added that I also witnessed a suspicious person in the neighborhood. A woman with a stroller who was staring at me so long and hard that it made me uncomfortable. I provided the date and time of the incident to see if their alleged stalker was actually me. It was, and apparently, my snide email had triggered the husband of that woman. He began sending email after email, CCing everyone on the list, telling me that he can, quote, read between the lines of what I was saying. His accusations became more and more ludicrous and turned into personal attacks. Several neighbors on the email list replied that he was behaving badly. The emails eventually stopped, but things did get even weirder. On several occasions while out walking my dog, a girl around the age of 10 would come out of her house, run over to me, awkwardly chat me up about my dog, and give me strangely intimate details of her life. I wondered why this child was talking to strangers but thought that maybe she knew me from the neighborhood, so I politely played along. Then one day the girl shows up at my house. She said she was angry because her dad wouldn't let her have a dog like mine so she wanted to visit my dog for a while. I told her that I needed to talk to her parents before I could ever let her visit my home like this. She said okay, left, and I never saw her anymore. I have two daughters though, and one of their friends told me that the girl that was chatting me up is the daughter of the triggered dude from the HOA email list. He had been sending her out to talk to me while he stood back and took pictures. My daughter's friend was friends with this bait girl. The poor girl's dad was making his own daughter uncomfortable, which is why she confided in her friend. The dad was sending his daughter out to chat with me, so he could accuse me of I don't know what. One detail I forgot to mention. 
I have dash cams in all my vehicles, and CCTV monitoring my front door. So the initial incident with the wife, as well as the girl coming to my door, were all recorded. I emailed the trigger dude and kindly offered him copies of the videos of each incident. I also told him I was concerned that his daughter was behaving inappropriately towards strangers. Apparently, this shorted out his plan, as I never heard from him, his daughter, or his staring wife ever again. <laughs>